Distinguished legislators, dear representatives of all stakeholder groups, esteemed guests, I very warmly welcome you to the first legislative main session in the history of the Internet Governance Forum. I hope you had very fruitful discussions so far and very enriching experiences. And together with you, I'm looking forward to the today's finals of the IGF. And I'm now very glad uh, in a minute to hand over the stage to Thomas Jatzomek for our first keynote today. He's a member of the German Parliament and he's the Economic Affairs Ministries Commissioner for the digital industry and startups. The floor is yours. Thomas Jatzomek. So, dear colleagues, dear legislators from all over the world, um, I appreciate very much that you're here, but um, today, so the session should be opened by a very dear colleague of us, by Jimmy Schulz. And um, I guess, as you all know, over this week, Jimmy died in the beginning of the week, and I guess we all should be still for a moment in respect to him. So thank you. And maybe you find the opportunities to sign the book for him behind there. And I can say so some years ago, we had uh, a special group in the German Bundestag uh, that had a working group on internet governance. And um, I was leading that this time. And uh, Jimmy was always the guy who traveled around the world for us. He was some kind of foreign affairs minister for the parliament, so to say. And whenever there were internet governance events all over the world, Jimmy was there and he always confronted us in the German Bundestag with the results of this. And in the beginning, some of us thought this is pretty strange what he's doing all over there. But in the end, he convinced us. He convinced us about how important internet governance is and he explained to a lot of colleagues from us how internet governance works. And this is the reason also why we are all together here, because he was a huge promoter for having the IGF here in Germany to explain to the public, but also to the colleagues in Parliament as in the government, how internet governance works and how important it is to be part in this internet governance and, and to set standards. And so we lost a very, very special colleague and he will uh, he, I will miss him personally and he will, he will leave a blank that cannot be filled. So thank you for your respect to Jimmy. And um, it is, to come to my speech, it is a very special IGF we have here in Germany because it's the first time that we arranged a parliamentarian session. With this day zero and that so many of you have spent the whole week here in Berlin and at this conference at the IGF, it's a very good sign. Because I believe in all these multi-stakeholder groups, there is one important group and these are the legislators. And it's important to take up all the challenges that we see uh, when it comes to internet legislation. Because the, the performance and the speed that we have in our democracies is not that fast as the development of the internet growth. And so what we are facing is for, uh, for years right now a very difference in speeds that uh, the internet community, the developments uh, in internet technology are moving very fast and the response of the legislators cannot be that fast in a democracy. And um, there are challenges all over the world. There are paradoxes you have to solve. There is in Europe the right to be forgotten and on the other side you want transparency and information on everything. And how to balance that out? These are questions that are unsolved until today and it's good to be here to have this discussion on a parliamentary level to bring also the knowledge from this conference back home. And especially these days, this year, the Internet is challenged, I think, uh, from two sides. The one side is that 
there are a lot of places in the world that are pretty proud to say now we have our own internet. And we, as Germany, are afraid that this global resource is maybe going to be fragmented, that barriers are raised up in the internet and that not everything can be freely spoken everywhere around the net. And so you are here in Berlin, a city that has been parted for a long, long time with a wall in between. And so we know that barriers and walls are not good. And prohibiting people from freely speech even is not good. And therefore, it's necessary to keep this free, global, open internet without any barriers. <clears throat> and the second challenge that I realize is coming from the industry. In the beginning of the internet, there were a lot of activists, there was a lot of open source, it was hands-on. And in the meantime, we have seen that there are big companies that raised, which are stars on the internet, fascinating companies that helped, that brought a lot of innovation, but they are challenging these free and open and federated standards that created the internet. And right now we see at every corner that new standards are born, but these are proprietary standards and not open standards. And the open standards are challenged by these proprietary standards from big companies. And we believe that the internet to uh, stay as a platform of innovation needs open standards. And therefore we in Germany, we fight, I guess, all together of, over all the barriers of the different parties for a free internet, for an open internet, for open standards, for open source, for open documentation, for open APIs. And um, this is relevant to stay this innovative platform. We don't want to see an internet that's in the end dominated by companies. We want to have an internet that's created by their users and by their community. And this is for us very, very important. Today, we are here to make the Jimmy Schulz call, as I hear. And I think this is a great tribute to a great politician who always declared, especially the topics and the values that I described right now. And um, so therefore, we're facing a lot of further challenges. What about crime on the internet? What about hate speech? How to balance that out against the freedom of speech? And um, therefore, it is good that uh, politicians all over the world uh, change, uh, exchange their uh, attitudes and exchange their thoughts and their strategies and to come to a good exchange. And um, therefore, we as the Ministry for Economic Affairs of Germany, we support this year our Secretary Peter Altmaier, from whom I shall bring the best wishes, who was here on the day zero and opened the parliamentary session. Uh, we support this very much. We are pretty proud that you're here in Berlin to be here for, the, for this week and I um, hope that you have a fruitful last day, a good explanation and we're all looking forward to the IGF next year in our neighbor country in Poland and we hope that we can continue to work with these values on one world, one net, one vision. Therefore, I wish a good time and I'm glad to stay with you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. If you had been here at the opening ceremony on Tuesday, you may have witnessed the moving words, the speech by Hans-Jörg Dürz on Jimmy Schulz. And we, in his memory, we have a condolence table over there. And I most kindly invite you to leave your personal notes and your personal memory in the condolence book over there at the left side. Thank you very much. And with these words, I'm now glad to hand over the stage to Hans-Jörg Dürz, He's a member of the German Parliament and he's the deputy chairman of the German committee
digital agenda. Very warm welcome on stage, Mr. Dutz. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen und möchte zuallererst Thomas Jatzonbeck für seine Worte Danke sagen. Als Vertreter eines Ausschusses des Deutschen Bundestages, dem er in der letzten Periode auch noch, zu Beginn dieser Periode auch noch angehört hat, ähm, freut es mich sehr, wenn ein Regierungsvertreter auch das hohe Lied auf die Einbindung des Parlaments, was ihm immer ein wichtiges Anliegen war, auch anstimmt. Und erlauben Sie mir, diesem Loblied auf die unterschiedlichen Akteure noch ein paar wenige Strophen hinzuzufügen. Vielen Dank an die deutsche Regierung und hier insbesondere das Wirtschaftsministerium dafür, dass sie mit Feuereifer die Bewerbung Deutschlands für die Ausrichtung des IGF unterstützt haben. Dafür, dass sie maßgeblich zur hervorragend gelungenen Organisation beigetragen haben, die aus dem IGF diese wundervolle Veranstaltung hier in Berlin gemacht hat. Dafür, dass sie sich nicht scheuten, auch vor Ort während dieser Woche als Ansprech- und Diskussionspartner zur Verfügung zu stehen. Vielen, vielen Dank den Vertretern des Bundeswirtschaftsministeriums. Zu loben sind jedoch auch Mitglieder des Deutschen Bundestages, denn es war eine Initiative von Parlamentariern, die den Anstoß dazu gab, das IGF in Deutschland auszurichten. Denn einige wenige Mitglieder unseres Parlaments haben schon seit geraumer Zeit regelmäßig am IGF teilgenommen, darunter auch der am Montag verstorbene Jimmy Schulz. Er und sein Team haben ga ganz viel gemeinsam geleistet, um das IGF 2019 und vor allem den parlamentarischen Part in Berlin möglich zu machen. Dafür ein ganz herzliches Dankeschön. Applaus Parlamentarier wie Jimmy Schulz haben schon früh erkannt, welche Bedeutung dem Internet und der damit einhergehenden Digitalisierung aller Lebensbereiche hat. Wie wichtig deshalb Debatten über die Gestaltung der Lebensader des 21. Jahrhunderts sind und dass an diesen Diskussionen die Zivilgesellschaft, Wirtschaftsvertreter, die technische Community, Regierungsvertreter, aber eben auch Parlamentarier teilnehmen müssen. Auf dem IGF im letzten Jahr hat sich diese Erkenntnis bei uns endgültig durchgesetzt, als wir mit einer Delegation des Ausschusses Digitale Agenda die Veranstaltung in Paris besuchten, stellten wir fest, dass viele der dortigen Diskussionen in unserem parlamentarischen Alltag zu wenig vorkommen. Und zwar deshalb klar, es muss sich diesbezüglich etwas ändern. Und heute wissen wir, es hat sich was geändert. Und daran haben Sie alle einen großen Anteil, denn dass Sie als Parlamentarier aus aller Welt der Einladung Deutschlands gefolgt sind und diese Woche hier in Berlin zusammengekommen sind, ist ein großer Gewinn sowohl für die Diskussionen auf dem IGF als auch für die Debatten in unseren, in Ihren und auch hier in Deutschland, in den Parlamenten. Denn ich bin sicher, dass Sie die Eindrücke und Erkenntnisse, die Sie hier gewonnen haben, mit in Ihre, Ihre Parlamente tragen. Ich wünsche mir, dass Sie als Abgeordnete diese Zeit hier in Berlin als fruchtbringend wahrgenommen haben und dass auch die Ausrichter künftiger Internet Governance Foren die Beteiligung von Politikern nicht als überflüssig erachten, sondern als Bereicherung der Debatten. Denn wenn uns Parlamentarier auf der ganzen Welt eines eint, dann ist es die Liebe zur fundierten Diskussion. Aus dieser Diskussionsfreude hoffen wir, eine neue Traditionslinie des IGF zu formen. Andere Traditionslinien des IGF wollen wir damit nicht unterminieren, sondern stärken. Seit jeher verstehen sich die Teilnehmer des IGF als Kämpfer für ein freies, offenes, dezentrales Internet. Ein Internet, zu dem jeder Mensch Zugang hat, ein Netz, das die Menschen verbindet, eine digitale Verbindungsmöglichkeit, die den Menschen dient und niemandem sonst. Mit der Teilnahme 
Am IGF wollen wir die Diskussionen um die freie Netzstruktur stärken. Diese Stärkung ist bitter nötig, denn die freie Netzstruktur wird zurzeit vor allem von zwei Entwicklungen herausgefordert. Thomas Jörg Zomberg ist auch darauf eingegangen. Denn Ursache liegt zum einen in den Köpfen der Menschen, zum anderen im Herzen technologischer Anwendungen. Lassen Sie mich beide Ursachen kurz erklären. Zunächst die Kopfsache. Verschiedene Staaten sind der Überzeugung, dass sie mit einem Intranet besser fahren als mit dem Anschluss an die globale Netzgemeinde. Und auch in Ländern, die traditionsgemäß multilaterale Problemlösungen befürworten, finden die Prinzipien klassischer Geopolitik zunehmend ihren Weg in die digitalpolitischen Überlegungen. Das kann man als Ausdruck dafür werten, dass die Digitalpolitik endlich erwachsen wird, dass sie ernst genommen wird als eigenständiges Politikfeld und ihre Bedeutung somit steigt und dass deshalb die tradierten politischen Denkweisen auch auf die digitale Welt angewendet werden. Man kann diese Entwicklung jedoch auch darauf zurückführen, dass manche Politiker die Herausforderungen der neuen digitalen Welt mit altbekannten Instrumenten angehen. Dies ist nicht notwendigerweise ein Fortschritt. Auf der anderen Seite das Herz technologischer Anwendungen. Denn nicht zuletzt werden wir durch das Eigenleben und die Entwicklungen der digitalen Welt herausgefordert. Sie sind Pulsgeber unseres digitalen Lebens. Doch nicht alle Anwendungen die dem Internet ihre Existenz verdanken, haben sich so entwickelt, wie das anfangs vorausgesagt wurde. Denn lange galt das Internet vor allem im Westen automatisch als Möglichmacher und Verstärker jenes politischen Theoriegebildes, das seit langem seine Grundlage ist. Die Rede ist von einem aufgeklärten Menschenbild. Vertreter von nicht westlichen Staaten werden sich möglicherweise schon länger gefragt haben, wie der Westen darauf kommt, dass die neue Technologie automatisch zu einer Verbreitung von Demokratie und Aufklärung führt. Auch im Westen müssen wir heute feststellen, unser Optimismus war nicht in jeder Hinsicht berechtigt. Bei weitem nicht jede Entwicklung hat die Aufklärung bekräftigt. Musste man zu Zeiten Immanuel Kants noch den Mut aufbringen, sich seines eigenen Verstandes zu bedienen, glauben manche, es genüge heute die Bedienung des eigenen Smartphones. Dies hat gravierende Folgen. Denn wir tragen mit den Endgeräten nicht nur das Wissen der Welt mit uns in der Hosentasche, sondern auch die Fehlinformationen. Dies kann seltsame Blüten tragen. Wer zum Beispiel nach Bildern von Immanuel Kant googelt, der bekommt zunehmend auch das Konterfei seines Widersachers Friedrich Jacobi zu sehen. Das Ergebnis der Google-Suche gilt aber vielen als so unfehlbar, dass selbst Experten es nicht mehr hinterfragen. Zunehmend wird das Bild von Jacobi in renommierten Beiträgen von Wissenschaftlern und Journalisten fälschlicherweise als Abbild Kanz ausgewiesen. Es ist nur eines von vielen Beispielen, das aufzeigt, wie sehr Algorithmen kulturelles Wissen beeinflussen, wie sie als Intermediär und Kompass in einer digitalen Welt leicht in die falsche Richtung zeigen können. Ähnlich ergeht es uns beim Blick auf so manche Anbieter sozialer Medien, waren sie einst gefeierte Neuentwicklungen der Digitalwirtschaft, die das Leben einfach und transparenter zu machen schienen, so fragen wir uns heute zunehmend, ob die rasant gewachsenen digitalen Monopole, Oligopole, die alleinige Verfügungsmacht über gewaltige Datenpools haben sollten. Deshalb ist es kein Wunder, dass wir neben Sicherheitsaspekten und dem Zugang zu möglichst vielen Menschen zum Netz auf dem diesjährigen IGF auch neue Regeln für das Internet und für die auf ihm laufenden Anwendungen und Plattformen gesucht haben. Und 30 Jahre nach Erfindung des Autos hat man die erste Straßenverkehrsordnung erdacht. Heute schreiben wir rund 30 Jahre Geschichte des zivilen Internets und die Frage nach den Verkehrsregeln der digitalen Welt steht heute im Raum. So war es auch am Montag der Fall, als wir Parlamentarier uns das erste Mal im Rahmen eines IGF zusammengesetzt haben, um über die aktuellen Herausforderungen zu diskutieren. Diese Zusammenkunft am Day Zero, über deren Ergebnisse gleich im Anschluss berichtet wird, war ein voller Erfolg. Nicht nur, weil so viele Parlamentarier teilgenommen haben, sondern auch, weil in Kleingruppen unter anderem 
über künstliche Intelligenz, die Beibehaltung einer offenen und sicheren Netzstruktur sowie über Chancen und Risiken der Digitalisierung für Demokratie gesprochen wurde. Bei den Diskussionen hat sich gezeigt, Parlamentarier vernetzen sich untereinander ähnlich schnell, wie sich Smartphones über das Internet miteinander verbinden. Die Interoperabilität von Schnittstellen scheint bei Abgeordneten also gegeben. Doch noch schöner war eigentlich der Moment, als wir wieder zurückfinden wollten in die große Runde, um die Ergebnisse zusammenzufassen, denn die Diskussionen waren so intensiv, dass es viel Mühe und mehrere Aufforderungen brauchte, bis jeder mit einiger Verspätung dann wieder auf seinem Platz saß. Meine Damen und Herren, ich hoffe, dass es sich mit dem Internet ähnlich verhält. Lassen Sie uns daran arbeiten, dass es den Gegnern eines offenen Internets ähnlich schwer fällt, das einmal global gespannte Netz wieder zu trennen, so wie es uns hoffentlich leicht fällt, die hier geknüpften Kontakte weiter zu pflegen. Lassen Sie uns daran arbeiten, dass Verbindungen in dieser Welt mehr wert sind als Trennungen. Ich habe mich sehr gefreut, dass UN-Generalsekretär Gutierrez bei der offiziellen Eröffnung des IGF am Dienstag die Ernennung eines Technologiebeauftragten der Vereinten Nationen angekündigt hat. Damit soll die Erarbeitung internationaler Rahmenbedingungen für die digitale Welt vorangetrieben werden. Beim diesjährigen IGF haben wir nicht einen Beauftragten unter den Parlamentariern, sondern gleich eine ganze Reihe. Diese werden uns nun die Ergebnisse aus den parlamentarischen Debatten vorstellen, die wir anschließend gemeinsam diskutieren wollen. Ich danke Ihnen schon jetzt für Ihre Teilnahme an dieser Diskussion und freue mich auf ein Wiedersehen auf dem IGF 2020 in Polen. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Dutz, for sharing your reflections and spreading the big challenges, and you just named it, uh, we are now experiences, experiencing the summaries of the IGF workshops during the next 75 minutes, 15 minutes approximately each, by German and international parliamentarian topic heads, and we start with the topic artificial intelligence, and I'm now honored to welcome on stage Dr. Anna Christmann, member of the German parliament, and Alexandra Gese, member of the European Parliament. Very welcome on stage, please. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here, and good to be here at the IGF, which I also think is a very important venue to come together and talk about these uh, technologies and uh, our, how they impact our future and how and what our role is to um, have an impact of that, on that future and um, how we can shape it. My name is Anna Christmann. I'm from the Green Party, a member of um, the Enquete Commission on Artificial Intelligence we have in the German Bundestag. Um, so we are um, involved in talking about all the issues related to AI over two years now um, and we'll have a full report on AI from a German perspective next year. Um, but I think it's very important to have venues like this where we talk about AI, artificial intelligence and on a global perspective because AI is a technology which will have a global impact, which has already a global impact so it's very important that we also talk on a global level about uh, artificial intelligence. And I think I will start now um, for around three or four minutes and then I will give over to my colleague from the European Parliament, Alexandra Gese. Um, first of all, um, I think it's important um, that we um, take for us as a legislators, uh, as a task to make sure that artificial intelligence is a technology where we use the chances, but where we also make sure that it will be a technology that is fruitful for our democracy and our liberal values we have in our society. And that is not a given thing. I think there is work to do to make exactly that sure. Because um, it should be our goal as legislators to develop artificial intelligence in a way that aligns with our values, 
human rights and also sustainability. In order to achieve that, we need to agree on shared standards internationally and determine the fields of application of AI that are desirable and those that need to be restricted or even banned, um, like, for example, lethal autonomous weapons, which I also want to mention, which is one part of our discussion on artificial intelligence. But on the other hand, we can shape AI for the benefit of the people and also for the environment. So there we have these two aspects of this technology where there is really an important role for us as legislators to um, impact the development of the technology in the near future. And of course, it will take a lot of time and energy to reach these kind of global agreements. But it is simply necessary and I think the IGF and events like this are an important step towards exactly that goal. And our German government published an AI strategy um, a year ago, and most countries did that. We have lots of AI strategies in Europe and other countries. Um, but I think it's, it's much uh, more is needed because it cannot be that every country only aims to be world champion on AI. Uh, but I think it, it needs a global um, ambition to have common standards that we can use the technology for our good. And especially, I don't think that countries that are as small as also Germany, I mean, and globally we are a small country, and there are many small countries in the world, um, so we shouldn't aim at uh, having globally technology leadership, but to have really a joint um, interest in this. And so we need to discuss, I think, global standards for AI. That means the techno technological as well as the ethical dimension. For example, we need to agree on standards for robust intelligent systems that are safe to use. At the time, we want to be able to understand what AI does and therefore need to agree on ways to make it explainable and therefore also truthfully. Because I think it's very important to have the people understanding this kind of technology it's a point of education, it's the point of making AI explainable, understandable, and going, uh, uh, going um, from a black box to an understandable technology. Um, that is something that is important from a legislative perspective. And we need to bring people on board through education. Citizens need to understand the principles of AI so they can really take part in the discussion. So I think something we have with the Enquete Commission here in Germany is, a, a, a possible, is a, a really a tool where we can reach this uh, aim to bring the people in the discussion and to really discuss in what fields we want to have more technology, more artificial intelligence, and in what um, fields maybe we want to have the human really be the uh, crucial part still. So this uh, is also a huge challenge um, regarding the labor market, maybe as the last aspect, which is also a very global discussion. I mean, we have uh, people are afraid that they might lose their jobs because of automation, um, because AI will be something that's going to replace humans. And I think that is a very too simple term for this um, development. I think it's much more complex and there are many chances as well as risks but we need to take serious that people think about all these things. And so um, it's our task, in my opinion, to really um, have this debate in an open way, to include people into this debate and to uh, invest in education and to take them together with us on that road. So um, I would be happy if we could really follow up this discussion on artificial intelligence and the many aspects to talk about in what kind of fields do we really want to develop joint standards? It's about autonomous vehicles, but it's also about um, maybe things that can help us for um, having, solving problems regarding to climate change. This is also a whole global task, and I would be happy if we could use a technology like AI also for these kind of global challenges uh, we are impact, uh, impacted all over the world. Thank you. Yeah, good morning from my side. My name is Alexandra Gies from the European Parliament. 
And talking about challenges, I have that very challenging task today to give you an overview about uh, the many discussions and debates that have taken place on AI during the IGF. Um, as we always say, um, there are quite a lot of opportunities, but there are also challenges, and I think this is true for artificial intelligence as well for uh, this task. Um, I was quite pleased that the discussion on artificial intelligence was kicked off by a network of bodies that one maybe not consider as experts of artificial intelligence, but by the network of equality bodies. And they might not be experts for the technology, but I think they are experts for bias. They have a long experience with that, and bias is one of the big issues that we are facing in artificial intelligence. While there are a great many opportunities, we also have to consider that AI should be serving everybody. That means also women, also people who are not white, also, pe also people with handicaps, and we know that this is not considered enough at the moment. Um, data was presented by uh, the National Equality Board's bodies, sorry, uh, that 70% of AI experts were not working on defining best practices for avoiding discrimination on AI. This is something we have to take on board as parliamentarians because we are representing the whole of society. Um, another workshop, um, discussed another kind of digital divide, the digital divide between uh, Europe or the US and Africa. And the director of the United Nations, uh, UN Global Pulse, talked about using AI for global good, noting that AI can hold great promise, but also present potential risks around bias and accountability. And also noted only 7% of AI developers are women. The African Union quite welcomed uh, the initiative of the UN and stressed that it should start at grassroots level. And he informed the, the representatives of the African Union informed participants about the 2019 Sharm el Sheikh Decla Declaration. Parliamentarians also had a workshop and they focused on issues like how could it be otherwise, democracy, very important, and peace. And then there were a series of um, recommendations presented by different global bodies the OECD Council, for example, that presented the OECD principles on AI approved in May 2019 for responsible stewardship of AI. There's also a UNESCO report called Steering AI at Advanced ICTs for Knowledge Societies, which explains, on the one hand, the positive right to information that has been approved to better internet connectivity and proliferation of platforms, where when we speak about internet connectivity, we have to consider that, for example, Africa, internet connectivity is definitely not a given and needs to be improved. But on the other hand, the same right could potentially um, be compromised by AI because it selects news and information that we see on the internet based on our data. I think there was a, uh, the common, a shared opinion that AI needs to be human-centric, that it needs to tackle the digital divide, and they need to have a multi-staker approach. It also needs to consider human rights and ethics, and it needs to implement the SDGs. Coming from the European Parliament, I would also like to stress that the European Commission that has been voted into office uh, on Wednesday this week has announced an initiative on a framework for the human and ethical implications of artificial intelligence within the first 100 days on office, in office. And I think this will be very interesting because uh, Europe has already set a global standard on data protection, and what it's going to be come up with might be a new global standards for the human and ethical implications on artificial intelligence. And I would like to appeal to all of us, this discussion should not only be a discussion where experts for the technology are involved. I think the task of experts for the technology is to explain to us, to society as a, whole, as a whole, what this technology can do, like tackle climate change, like making our lives easier. But then we have to take, bring all the stakeholders to the table to decide together as a society how we want to use artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for summarizing this core topic. We come to another key topic, which is the international cooperation to secure an open and free internet. 
something which we are tackling since day zero uh, this year. And I'm happy to introduce on stage Ulrich Lechte, the member of the German parliament, together with your, on your own. You are joined then by Leonid Levin, member of the Russian parliament. And this is your clicker, please. That's uh, is so tief wie es sein soll. Exzellenzen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Kollegen, die heute Morgen hierher gekommen sind. Es war mir eine große Ehre, dass ich den IGF-Workshop für ein offenes und freies Internet moderieren durfte. Wir hatten eine breite Beteiligung von Parlamentariern aus aller Welt, von Ägypten, Demokratischen Republik Kongo, Burundi, Nicaragua, Brasilien, Bangladesch und einige mehr. Ich möchte mich ganz herzlich bei allen bedanken, die zum Erfolg des Workshops beigetragen haben. Wir wussten ja nicht, was beim ersten Mal mit Parlamentarierbeteiligung tatsächlich passieren würde. Und es war überraschend, dass so viele von Ihnen gekommen sind. Der Vertreter Russlands konnte an unserem Workshop leider nicht dabei sein. Mein Kollege Leonid Levin aus der russischen Duma wird daher nach äh, meiner Rede, die fünf Minuten in Anspruch nimmt, dann die russische Perspektive ergänzen. Ich beschränke mich bei meiner Präsentation dabei natürlich nur auf die Ergebnisse unseres Workshops und werde sie mit meiner eigenen Meinung da nicht belästigen. Unterschiedliche Auffassungen sind ja quasi der Kern des Parlamentarismus und das ist das Schöne an unserer Arbeit, dass wir immer was zu diskutieren haben und immer unterschiedliche Vorstellungen über das, wie man Ziele erreicht. Meine Damen und Herren, lassen Sie mich mit dem Zusammenhang und dem Zugang zum Internet beginnen. Für uns in diesem Saal ist Wi-Fi selbstverständlich. Wir Deutschen haben dafür natürlich auch wieder ein eigenes Wort mit WLAN. Und ähm, manchmal merkt man ja, dass zu viele Geräte drin sind und dann funktioniert es nicht richtig. Wie letztens in Paraguay, im Parlamentsgebäude, da waren dann zu viele Geräte auf einmal an und schon war der, die Geschwindigkeit nicht so sonderlich gut. Aber gerade äh, viele Menschen auf der Welt haben eben keinen Zugang zum Internet und äh, besonders in den armen Regionen, Regionen. Dementsprechend waren wir uns im Workshop einig, äh, dass wir auch alle Menschen an das Internet anschließen sollten, vor allem auch die Armen der Welt. Wir waren uns natürlich überraschenderweise nicht ganz einig äh, über den Weg, wie wir dorthin kommen. Ähm, einige wollten den Internetzugang als Menschenrecht verbriefen. Andere haben widersprochen und wollen dies dem Markt überlassen und sehen das als den möglichst effizientesten Weg zur Erreichung des Ziels. Wir waren uns aber einig, dass arme Länder Unterstützung beim Ausbau der Internetsachen bekommen sollen. Außerdem waren wir uns einig darüber, dass eine faire Besteuerung bei Online-Geschäften nötig ist, dass also alle Staaten auch Zugang zu den Steuereinnahmen haben, die in ihren Staaten entsprechend generiert werden. Beim Thema Zugang zum Internet ergab die Diskussion, dass die Menschen nicht nur in Teilen, sondern Zugang zum gesamten Internet haben sollten. Wir wollen eine Fragmentierung des Internets verhindern, getreu dem Motto des IGFs, One World, One Net, One Vision. Um das zu erreichen, haben sich die meisten von uns gegen das Blockieren von Inhalten und gegen Zensur im Internet ausgesprochen. Auch diese Meinung war erneut nicht einheitlich. Es gab einzelne Stimmen, die solche Maßnahmen im Interesse der Sicherheit nicht ausschließen wollten. Daher möchte ich daran appellieren, dass wir uns zumindest an die universellen Menschenrechtsstandards halten. Für alle Mitgliedstaaten der Vereinten Nationen gilt die allgemeine Erklärung der Menschenrechte. Artikel 19 regelt das Recht auf freie Meinungsäußerung. Wow, okay. Um, it's wonderful to have uh, your worker here. Um, Artikel 19 regelt das Recht auf freie Meinungsäußerung, Artikel 20 das Recht auf Versammlungsfreiheit. Diese Rechte gelten ohne jeden Zweifel auch online. Unter dem Aspekt der Sicherheit haben wir über den Schutz von persönlichen Daten gesprochen. Dies war uns allen unisono ein wichtiges Anliegen. Das Recht auf Privatsphäre ist in Artikel 12 der Allgemeinen Erklärung der Menschenrechte geregelt. Jenseits des Rechts auf Privatsphäre benötigt man aber auch die Mittel zur Durchsetzung dieses Rechts. Im Memoriam von Jimmy, ganz konkret haben wir über ein Recht auf Ende-zu-Ende-Verschlüsselung ohne irgendwelche Hintertürchen gesprochen. Damit die, damit die persönlichen Daten der Menschen vor dem Zugriff der Staaten und der Konzerne der Welt auch wirklich sicher sind. 
also vor den Staaten und den Konzernen, reine Privatheit für alle Menschen. Für die Sicherheit der Daten ist es außerdem wichtig, dass wir international gegen Cybercrime kooperieren, denn keine andere Kriminalitätsform kann so schnell und einfach mehrfach Staatsgrenzen überwinden wie die Cyberkriminalität. Da möchten wir einen Appell aussprechen, dass möglichst viele Staaten die Budapest Convention gegen Cybercrime von 2001 ratifizieren. Natürlich muss man diese auch stets weiterentwickeln, weil die Zeit ja voranschreitet. Zum Thema offenes Internet haben wir über die Gefahr von Monopolen gesprochen. Wir wollen das Internet als einen offenen Raum für neue Ideen und neue Geschäftsmodelle bewahren, haben meine Vorgänger ja auch schon gesagt. Um das zu erreichen, benötigen wir ein wirksames Wettbewerbsrecht. Damit muss einerseits der Monopolbildung vorgebeugt werden, andererseits muss man dort, wo sich schon Monopole oder quasi Monopole gebildet haben, regulierend eingegriffen werden, damit die Plattformen offen für Wettbewerber sind und damit wir echte Chancengleichheit gewähren. Final möchte ich noch etwas ansprechen, worüber wir uns alle einig waren. Das Internet ist das Eigentum der gesamten Menschheit, nicht einzelner Konzerne und auch nicht von Staaten. Daher begrüßen wir als Parlamentarier ausdrücklich den Multi-Stakeholder-Ansatz des Internet Governance Forums. Herzlichen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Я представляю Россию. Парламент Российской Федерации решите мне говорить на своем родном языке, на русском языке. Я являюсь председателем комитета по информации, информационным технологиям и связи российского парламента. Спасибо за возможность высказаться сегодня на этой важной панельной сессии и в том числе озвучить позицию России. Правовая база, регулирующая взаимодействие граждан, бизнеса и государства сетью интернет, совершенствуется уже не одно десятилетие. Однако последние несколько лет мы наблюдаем новый тренд выстраивания цифровых суверенитетов государствами, расположенными в разных частях мира. Это обусловлено фактором увеличения количества и разнообразия угроз, исходящих из киберпространства. Хакерские атаки на финансовые, энергетические, транспортные и другие жизненно важные структуры способны вызвать масштабный коллапс целых регионов. Кражи персональных данных, кибербуллинг, манипулирование общественным мнением подрывают доверие пользователей к среде, созданной как трансграничное средство универсального общения. Вынуждают государства создавать регуляторные барьеры для сохранения безопасности граждан. Берлинская стена, о которой сегодня уже говорилось, символ разделения людей была разрушена 30 лет назад, но сегодня парламентарии и правительства многих стран заняты тем, что выстраивают такие же стены в киберпространстве. Еще год назад на Парижском форуме по управлению интернетом звучали идеи о выработке норм, обязательных для исполнения на общем мировом пространстве. И что же изменилось за этот год? Возможно, парламентам ведущих экономик мира все же пора сдвинуть этот процесс из состояния неопределенности, начать совершать уже конкретные шаги по выработке взаимно совместимых законов. Здесь уже говорилось, что этот форум задумывался исключительно как экспертная площадка, но сейчас очевидно, что сообщество ожидает более конкретных рекомендаций и политических решений. Роль законодателей в работе IGF с каждым годом становится заметней, как и общее внимание к регулированию в различных странах. Поэтому можно с большей долей уверенности сказать, что принимаемые Организацией Объединенных Наций, зачастую противоречащие по смыслу резолюции по тематике интернета, могут обсуждаться на всей системе форумов по управлению интернетом. Целесообразно рассмотреть Изменение статуса IGF с перспективой сделать его площадкой предварительного обсуждения обязывающих документов ООН, на которые можно было бы решать все противоречащие до выноса их на Генеральную Ассамблею. 
Госпожа федеральный канцлер Германии Ангела Меркель на открытии упомянула, что хотела бы видеть, как международные соглашения находят свои отражения в национальном законодательстве. И IGF может играть в этом гораздо более значимую роль. Еще один вызов для современной цивилизации – это технологии искусственного интеллекта. Успехи решений на его основе, ровно как и запрос со стороны общества, ведут к тому, что искусственный интеллект скоро будет применяться в задачах государственного управления. Аналогично тому, как мультистейкхолдеризм, мультистейкхолдерный подход традиционно используется для управления интернетом, общность концепции цифровой трансформации и внедрение искусственного интеллекта. Здесь э, важно, чтобы этот процессы государственного управления позволяли странам мира выстраивать открытые и гармоничные отношения и вместе двигаться по пути прогресса. Сегодня основополагающий международный договор в сфере кибербезопасности – это Будапештская конвенция 2001 года. Однако прошло уже почти 20 лет, интернет серьезно изменился, и некоторые эксперты считают, что ряд ее положений устарел и требует пересмотра. Россия занимает проактивную позицию, выстраивая диалог со странами-участницами конвенции по вопросам борьбы с преступлениями в цифровой среде. В ноябре состоялись российско-французские консультации, где было отмечено, что, несмотря на разногласия и различия по целому ряду вопросов, нам надо лучше понимать друг друга и отстаивать каналы коммуникации и координации быстрого реагирования. Обсуждается возможность заключения соглашения о взаимной выдаче киберпреступников между Россией и Японией. Новым шагом стало внесение в ноябре этого года на рассмотрение Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН проекта новой резолюции, озаглавленной о противодействии использованию информационно-коммуникационных технологий в преступных целях. Отдельные критики пытаются доказать, что ее положение направлено на создание универсального инструмента блокировки в отношении интернет-ресурсов неугодных оппозиционных политиков и объединений. Однако при этом игнорируется то обстоятельство, что количество фиксируемых киберпреступлений продолжает расти. При этом основной целью резолюции является как раз борьба с киберкриминалом совместными усилиями международного сообщества. Можно предположить, что за подобной позицией скрывается нежелание или неготовность взять на себя ответственность в принятии универсальных трансграничных законов, позволивших бы более эффективно бороться с цифровой преступностью. Основным фактором, осложняющим выработку единых международных норм, стали накопившиеся за десятилетия в регуляторных подходах в действующих законах и даже терминологии. Выглядит обоснованным предложение российской стороной создание межправительственного комитета для разработки международной конвенции о противодействии использованию информационно-коммуникационных технологий в преступных целях. Предложения, которые бы отвечали современным реалиям. В заключении своего выступления хотелось бы сказать, что интернет, который многие десятилетия был открытой и прозрачной, трансграничной средой, сегодня переживает процесс балканизации, размежевания на отдельные сегменты в технологическом и регуляционном аспектах. Этот этап, который обусловлен недостаточно эффективными межгосударственным сотрудничеством при обгоняющих темпах технического и социально-культурного развития, и его можно рассматривать как детскую болезнь глобальной сети. Уверен, что уже в ближайшем будущем совместными усилиями парламентов разных стран мы сможем найти компромисс в работе универсальных международных норм, обеспечивающих устойчивое и безопасное развитие цифрового общества. Уважаемые коллеги, дорогие парламентарии, нам надо больше брать на себя инициативу, занимать более активную позицию по формированию единой трансграничной правовой сети. Больше оказывать давление на свои правительства в этом вопросе. И важно отметить, что необходимость этих норм, о них говорят не только парламентарии, но и говорят не только эксперты, но и сами руководители многих конституциональных компаний. Только за последний год ряд их собственников, руководителей говорили как раз о том, что они ждут, от мирового сообщества выработки единых принципов, по которому бы огромное количество трансграничных международных транснациональных сервисов могло бы работать и понимать общие принципы в этой сфере. Давайте постараемся помочь 
всем нам и в первую очередь нашим гражданам для выработки единых принципов работы информационного пространства. Большое спасибо. Thank you for your diverse reflections and takeaways, gentlemen. We are now digging deeper on the question how to secure critical infrastructures, and we are doing, doing so together with Ronja Kemmer, member of the German Parliament, and Charles Mock, member of the Legislative Council for the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Very welcome on stage, please. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ronja Kemmer. I'm a member of the German Parliament, and I think that the uh, discussion during the IGF uh, this week made it really clear that the open and uh, free architecture of the Internet is an essential. An essential for competition, for fair competition, an essential for innovation, but also for democracy. And risks and undesired developments in the Internet I think are increasingly having a direct impact on our everyday lives. So today an effective international governance is not possible without cyber stability. And of course, if you want to pursue the goal of a free internet, one of the most important requirements is the underlying core infrastructure. And unfortunately, we heard that before that day and also during the week, the open architecture is under pressure. And this is, I think, due to main reasons. On the one hand, some countries have tendencies to fragment the internet, to create um, closed and national intranets or other systems. And as a result, I think, of the discussions during this week, I note that there is a broad consensus that we must work at all levels to prevent further fragmentation of the internet. And therefore, I think in particular, a spin of states or even of entire regions um, of the central infra infrastructure of the common address system, the DNS, must be counteracted. And on the other hand, new challenges for the security of the internet infrastructure occur, occur of course from the technical side. The contributions at the IGF have shown that especially with regard to new technologies as AI, as IoT, as big data, um, create new challenges. And um, seeing the attacks now, um, I think we see a lot of serious problems. If such attacks are successful, vital parts of the infrastructure fail. For example, the energy supply can be impaired. Serious disruptions in the flow of, traffic can, um, of the traffic can occur. And also, the basic civil services, such as search and rescue, may be impaired. From an economic point of view, also financial losses occur in all countries, all over the world. According to a big comp study, companies in Germany, just only in Germany in the last two years, between 2016 and 2018, might have lost around 33 billion euros due to cyber attacks. I think that it has also become very clear that we are facing the risk of citizens as well as companies losing confidence in digital processes if we do not manage to do better um, securing the critical infrastructure. And the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace published its final report just two weeks ago. And the Commission proposed a standard to protect the core elements of the Internet architecture. And this applies to both, to attacks by governmental, but also by non-governmental actors. And the Commission has stressed also that the goal can only be achieved with a multi-stakeholder approach, especially with regard to more common legislation and respective enforcement of these laws. So in my opinion, this is exactly the path we need to take. From the German side, we are really committed to further strengthen the multi-stakeholder approach. We need these constructive dialogues
between, of course, states and representatives of the states, but also between international organizations, companies, science and civil society. So this has been the first time this year that I think such a strong involvement of parliamentarians um, has been taking place during the IGF. And I think we have to continue to build this great foundation in the future. So what is important now is that we build on the success of the last days, um, that internet governments, of course, doesn't end with the last day of the IGF, and that every single of us is now called upon to carry the results to our fellow lawmakers and to continue working on the topics with commitment. And of course, responsibility for the internet structure lies not only with lawmakers or regulatory agencies, of all, it has been, I, th I think, become very clear from the contributors of the representatives of ICANN and ITU and others, especially that the latter are important key players. But ultimately, responsibility also lies with every user. Each individual bears his or her responsibility when it comes to cyber hygiene. So ensuring that data is well protected against attacks um, using secure passwords and regular updates, as well as working with adequate hardware. So I think it is important that we create more awareness for the importance of the internet governments and especially for a technical understanding that has been or has to be brought into um, the social debate and also into um, yeah, the politician or political decision-making processes to a greater extent. And I'm really optimistic that we can do this. And if you have seen the passion and determination uh, from the people here around the world during the last days, I hope that you are also as uh, that optimistic. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. I am Charles Mock, and I am a member of the Legislative Council of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of China. And uh, in, in, in my capacity, this time uh, to join the Internet Governance Forum is actually a new experience for me. Because previously, when I joined the ITF, I was not having the uh, capacity as a parliamentarian, but at the time, I was either a member of the industry or as a member of uh, civil society when I was the founding chairman of the Internet Society of Hong Kong. So I can say that probably I have seen from the different perspective. But now, as I'm trying to use the capacity of the uh, a parliamentarian, I do see that there are new perspectives and new angle that we can bring to the IGF uh, proceedings and the IGS, IGF experience. I have found that, in fact, in many of our, well, in, in our different jurisdiction, including in Hong Kong, in recent years, the development of the digital infrastructure has become a very important topic. And having said that, that actually means that Governments are trying to use digital technologies to develop their economy, to improve social uh, 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 services and all, in all different kinds of areas. But oftentimes, we come across the problem that many of the parliamentarians are actually not very familiar with the technologies that we are trying to promote. And also, when it comes to issues such as the uh, handling of the critical infrastructure, use of different technologies, concerns from the public about uh, human rights and surveillance issues and so on, parliamentarians may not necessarily be very prepared. So sometimes uh, it is also very important for us to be able to network with the different parliamentarians from different parts of the world with a similar understanding about the technology, but putting the uh, problems into different perspectives and trying to find the good answers, solutions for what we have to deal with. In the situation where I come from, 
our government is trying to develop their smart city initiatives and so on, which is very similar to many other cities in the world. But I think the problems that sometimes we encounter is how to explain the benefits to the citizens, how to make sure that citizens are trustful of the government when governments are creating and handling many of their data that many people are beginning to become very sensitive about in today's world. They are not only sensitive about the handling of data by big technology companies, but oftentimes also by governments, especially when in the cases of some governments where the trust of the people in the government is relatively low. So, so this is the area that I think we have to be very careful about. Uh, particularly in my situation in where I come from, I think we are in a particularly sensitive period of time. So I think a lot of times when we see many of the developed world countries talking about the issues about critical infrastructure and security of the internet, the perspective may be because they are having the background and support of a democratic foundation where these foundations do not necessarily exist in other parts of the world. So oftentimes when it comes to how to handle and work with the big tech and how to make sure that the services they provide are secure, the solutions that are called for sometimes by the Western countries may not be necessarily applicable to others in uh, the world. Uh, where uh, I'm not even saying that they, this is about developed world or developing world, but simply where the democratic institutions are not as secure or mature. So this is one area that I think, I hope, through the IGF process, we can bring about more understanding and more uh, common solutions that we can use to tackle this very complicated problem of that technologies have brought about for all of our governments and parliamentarians and corporations and civil society, most of all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles Mock and Ronja Kemmer. We have two more summaries in this morning session now. The next one is how to keep and to safeguard peace in the digital age. And I'm now welcoming on stage Falco Moors, member of the German parliament, and Marianne A. Azer as a member of the parliament of Egypt. Very warm welcome on stage. Guten Morgen. <laughs> That's it for now. Um, uh, dear fellow parliamentarians um, and from all over the world, I would like to especially thank on your behalf the members of the German parliament for the, making this uh, parliamentary session work the way we see it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like also to hold the opportunity to express my gratitude to IGF uh, because also of the testimony they gave to uh, His Excellency Dr. Tarek Kamel during the opening ceremony. Um, he was the ex-Minister of Communication in Egypt. May his soul rest in peace. So uh, I have like one question. Do we really care about the peace in the digital age? I think we all do. And if we obviously the internet has become definitely one of the areas of future conflict. And in, in the opening ceremony, uh, His Excellency Secretary General had mentioned in his opening remarks very important questions that I will say and add on them. The first question said, where will the technology take us? And I might add, to peace or to war? The second question is, Will our dignity and rights be enhanced or diminished? And my question, and what about our peace? The third thing, will our societies be more equal or less equal? And my question is, how will the divide triangle 
of digital, political and social divide affect the peace? Will we become more or less secure or safe? This was his question and I'm concerned how the cybersecurity and privacy if affect the peace. Let me state some of the challenges and we as parliamentarians are used to vote. So if you find one of the challenges extremely important and relevant, please, please raise the right hand. If it's less relevant, please raise the left hand if you wish. So let's start with the first challenge. The first is how to set a framework to protect individuals from the use of surveillance technologies that interface with the enjoyment of human rights. Is it right or left? It's up to you. These include a range, thank you for voting, of measures for states about users and exporters of surveillance technologies as well as company to meet their respective obligations and responsibilities. The second challenge, and we will vote on this, is how to strike the right balance between benefits and costs across all expert control categories for dual use items. And I'll explain more before the vote. So, as you know, the expert controls are among the most complicated policy issues to address. Expert controls combine laws, technologies, and policies with national and international level, and in this case also sit directly at the intersection of human rights, security, and business. So it's an important challenge or not, I trust you. The third challenge is how to face the new forms of violence through the Internet of Things devices. The number of IoT devices is expected to be 22 billion in 2025. And despite the lack of specific laws, IoT evidence is already showing up to courts. So is it a challenge or not? Uh, the fourth thing is the public, it's our public interest to protect dignity and peace. So how to solve the conflict with the interests of social networking companies? And I'll explain more before the vote. In one of the sessions, there was a representative of these countries, and he mentioned that every minute there is 500 hours of uh, media that is posted, and 1% is guaranteed to be illegal or harmful. So he said, there is an issue, we can't deny it, but you need to know the, the, the amount of effort that needs to be done for this. So is it important or not for the social companies? A related question to this challenge is how can we tackle online hate speech and cyberbullying with children? And there is that fine balance between the freedom of speech and criminal prosecution. The sixth is how to deliberate governance approaches for this information. So this information is one of the major challenges for the peace through self-regulatory, what is done in the, the European governments is self-regulatory uh, codes of practices, direct regulations on online content and the development of legislations. However, during the sessions, the floor added to this that there might be a, a, a good, uh, we need to distinguish very well between individual disinformation and industrial disinformation because the later is done by bots and like more machine oriented so it needs to be uh, well distinguished. The comments from participants varied from demanding more transparency from the platform side regarding their business model, the collect and use of data and function of the algorithm to an invitation to completely uh, rethink the core of their business model. This is very dangerous. Uh, some comments are argued that the freedom of expression is not an absolute right. It is provided and regulated by law. Finally, after having talked about all this, a major challenge, and I think we all agree about it, is how to quantify peace and conflict in cyberspace. This is how to say there is real peace or there is no. It's difficult to measure peace in cyberspace because of geopolitical tensions. However, possible indicators might be, if you think, a measure of the gravity and number of cyber attacks, for instance. And the second thing is the indicators showing the likelihood of being a country of origin of cyber attack. And how does 
the so international society deal with them? Are there sanctions for the countries that issue this terrorism? We don't know. Finally, an important question is who will be able to tackle these challenges? And this is the most important, this is why we are here, because peace is a human issue and needs to be implemented on a hu by human actors. And I recall Mother Teresa Scott who said, if we have no peace, that we have forgotten that belong to one and other. So the only solution is a collaborative stakeholder approach with a focus on human rights, protection of critical infrastructures, reporting of vulnerabilities, and security concerns in the supply chain. Finally, the most important is the follow-up mechanisms after the whistle is blown, is to maintain peace in the digital sphere. And I will end uh, my summary by editing a quote by Ronald Reagan who said, peace is not the absence of conflict, it is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means, and I would add, of one world using one net and having one vision, peace. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And even though it's the last day here in Berlin, I'd still like to welcome you here. Um, Berlin is a very iconic city when it comes to the question of peace and to the German history. And I guess it's now one of the most lively and vibrant examples of inclusion, tolerance, but also innovation when it comes to technical questions. So I guess it's a very good place to hold the IGF here in 2019. And I hope you all had a very fruitful week here in our capital. When it comes to the question of internet and peace, we all know that there are different narratives. There's one that is very much focusing on the independence and the power of independence that lies within the internet, and one that is questioning or that is focusing more on the question that it comes from a military history and focusing on its negative side. And I'm sure all or many of us are witnesses of both the positive and the negative powers of the internet. And when I think back a couple of years when I've been an advisor to the World Bank in the North African region on youth policies back in the years 2009 to 2012, we have seen that the internet, that social networks have a power when it comes to civil society, when it comes to challenging governments, even though some of the challenges are, looking on a long-term perspective, have not been very sustainable. And we also see it today, and I'm very much in solidarity with the people on the streets of Hong Kong that also use today the internet for their fights of freedom. But we also see that governments are using internet for sanctions, controlling and censoring opinions. So we see when it comes to the question of peace, there are two dimensions that we need to tackle and we need to take in our focus. And the internet and the peace is challenged by both, by governments, but also by non-governmental actors. So it's all our responsibilities, and we need the multi-stakeholder approach for that to secure security, safety, and integrity in the internet. So we need a framework, we need rules, international rules, when it comes to securing these dimensions. And I'm sure that we need a rights-based, a human rights-based approach when it comes to the framework. Human rights must be the underlying element when it comes to peace and freedom in the internet. So one of the questions in the very first days that we heard was, what kind of capacity and capabilities do governments and countries need? Do they need capacities for counterattacks, for hackbacks? And still keeping in mind that there is a severe problem when it comes to attribution of attacks. 
The Diplo Foundation, in its report, have published that roughly 50 countries confirm that they have these kind of hackback and counter attack capacities when it comes to the internet. And we in Germany as well are debating whether we need these kind of capacities. And of course it is the right of every country to defend itself both on and offline. But we also need to make sure that every country and government's actions are relatively to its threats. My, my dear colleague has mentioned the question of how do we measure the level of peace and security, and I don't want to repeat, but because I believe she has done it very well. But of course, when we talk about peace, that is the main question. How do we actually measure peace in the internet? And as I mentioned, we need a multi-stakeholder approach because everyone has a crucial role in that. And that's why I'm so glad that the IGF is such an example of a multi-stakeholder approach here. So to summarize, let's be very clear. We need a human rights-based approach. We cannot leave space for compromising or violating human rights in the internet. And it's our, our global, but also our national, common responsibility to secure this peace and to secure that the critical infrastructure of telecommunication and communication network is secure and peaceful and that we can ensure the positive power that lives in the internet. Thank you very much and I really hope that you can all take back lots of input and that we can, will be able to follow up what we've seen over the last days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Moores. And Marianne, uh, thank, may I make it like this? In Germany, it's very strange to hold up your right hand. But may I say this? Thank you for all your enriching summaries so far in this session. And we make it a full circle um, now with our last summary. We are asking the question, digital age, is it democracy's tool or trap? And we are doing so with Anke Domscheit-Berg, who is a member of the German parliament. And we have Karin Melchior as a member of the European Parliament. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, difficult to speak in the very last round. Um, I'd like to present myself shortly, as was said. I'm Anke Domscheit-Berg, member of the German Parliament. I'm the Internet Policy Speaker of the Left Party and also member of the Enquete Commission on Artificial Intelligence. When we discuss many of those problems, as we have heard already today. I was leading the workshop on day zero with the parliamentary group in which we discussed topics around democracy and digitalization. And it was a very intense discussion we had with parliamentarians coming from all sorts of countries all over the world, such as from Mongolia, from Brazil, from Hong Kong, from the Maldives, Japan, El Salvador, and Denmark, and of course also from Germany. We talked about four issues, mainly the biggest being um, the challenges by digital monopolies where we all agreed that we have a global failing antitrust regulation. We saw the issue of election interference and misinformation, and we also exchanged not only that we felt we see these problems, we also tried to discuss national approaches, how to deal with these challenges. So we heard, for example, from Brazil that there is a regulation planned to enforce more transparency on digital, um, on political advertisements. In Germany, there was an expert group working on competition law 4.0 to deal with the challenges of monopolies. 
But we also heard from a member from the Hong Kong Parliament that there are very country-specific challenges and that you cannot just transfer one regulation to another country. So what one country can use to fight misinformation could another country use for censorship and that must be prevented. We talked also about the lock-in effects, the network effects making monopolies so powerful and what can be done about it, which is really a big challenge to tackle. We all agreed that we need more forced interoperability, better working standards. But we also went a bit farther. We were discussing whether it's not a good idea to have something like a not-for-profit social network on a global basis because we talk about social infrastructure of the digital society. And we were discussing, open-ended, who could actually do this or organize it. We came up with the United Nations, but this was, as I said, an open-ended discussion. We were also talking about the issue how to break two big monopolies. Who could do this? And it was uh, not easy for us to find out. We didn't find the perfect answer. Most of us were suspecting um, the US can do this and nobody else. Uh, I'm not so sure about it. And I know that at least at the European Union level, there are discussions, um, especially on how to probably unwind already taken place mergers like the one between Facebook and WhatsApp or Facebook and Instagram. We also talked about the importance of data dominance by digital monopolies and what could be done about this. And there is an international discussion going on and whether it's probably a good idea to force big monopolies to open up part of their data, non-person related data. We didn't find a consensus on that one. Um, because there were interesting questions on what kind of data, how could it be enforced. So it's not an easy one, but it was an interesting one for all of us. I will briefly uh, talk about the other challenges we covered. We talked, for example, also about hate crimes, violence against children and women in the Internet and what can be done about that. In one country, I believe it was Brazil, we had the challenge that digital evidence so far is not recognized in courts and now there is a legislation in plan to change that. In Germany we are now, um, there was a decision by the government taken to create a special criminal department with required competences to deal with digital hate crimes. And we are not talking about hate, yeah, many people can just hate, that's freedom of speech, but there is a type of hate going over the red line and that is hate crime, uh, violating penalty code and that should be dealt with accordingly. The third challenge we discussed was the internet access to all because you can also take, only take part in an effective uh, democracy if you have access um, to the internet. And then there are um, different challenges again from country to country. In Brazil there's also a legislation and plan to make internet access a universal right. And somebody from Mongolia said we would like the same, but Mongolia for the biggest part of it has a very, very low density of population. And so it's an extremely high challenge to make this a reality and they still have not found out how to actually do this. And the last topic I would like to mention is everything around privacy, data protection, not only what big companies do with our data, talking about Cambridge Analytica, etc., but also about what governments do with the data. In the European Union, the general data protection regulation was mentioned by um, parliamentarians from other continents as a blueprint, which they not copy one-to-one, -one, but take as a good example, which they adapt in part to their own regulation. And as to the use of government of personal data by governments, um, there's also a decision being taken by the German government to establish a so-called data dashboard where citizens will be able to see in the future what kind of data the government at all federal levels has stored about them and what public authority had accessed what type of data. 
So that is a very brief um, description of what we discussed on our workshop on Monday. In summary, I can say we realized that across continents we shared the same um, issues. We realized we can learn a lot from each other, but not copy-paste. We must also uh, broaden our perspectives and recognize that what is good in one country can be bad in another. We would look forward to continue this debate on further IGFs, but we also had another conclusion that we should copy the multi-stakeholder approach on how to deal with internet policy to our own national uh, decision-making, political decision-making, that is. So bring more multi-stakeholder approaches to parliaments. That was what we liked. Thank you. Hallo und danke äh, die deutsche Regierung und die deutsche Parlament für die Invitation äh, für die parlamentarische äh, Versammlung. And that's the German for me today. 30 years after tearing down the wall here in Berlin, uh, we must remember that now is not the time to set up new digital walls and fences. We need to use the opportunity that digital tools give us to communicate with our citizens. The open and the free internet allows for empowering our citizens to engage in their society. We must use digital tools to open up our governments and authorities to, control, to be controlled by our citizens. Because who do we serve if not our citizens and all of our citizens? Our citizens must be protected, but not against an undefined cybercrime. We must ensure the integrity of each of our citizens against mass surveillance by our governments, our police authorities, our security services from across the world, but also from commercial surveillance by companies, data brokers, and by platforms. We as parliamentarians must insist on getting oversight of what data is being used, how we're being treated, and we must ask of the platforms to help societies to have democratic dialogue it should be free and open, uniting our society. Not allowing business models to push us towards more and more polarized positions through market tar micro-targeting and attention economy. <clears throat> we must not allow our colleagues to spread lies and fear about their fellow citizens. For no matter our religion, our ethnicity, our gender, our sexuality, our political views, we're all humans, we're all citizens with equal rights in our societies and in our world. These equal rights are or should be the foundation for our cyberspace. These equal rights and our human rights need to be supported, not undermined, by the, technologi the technological tools of the cyberspace, which is why we must defend end-to-end -end encryption, net neutrality, and access to information. This is the foundation for a free, open, stable, unfragmented, and innovative cyberspace, as is called for in the Jimmy Schultz call. This should be our one vision for one net, for one world. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies, for this last summaries. Um, can I take the principle of Marianne and ask you uh, now to raise your right hand if you think it was a good idea and a very good initiative to have such a strong voice of the parliamentarians in this year's IGF, so please raise your right hand. If you don't think, use your left hand. I don't see much contradiction. Okay, thank you very much for this idea, Marianne. Um, I hand over now the stage for our 45 minutes panel discussion, including a strong Q&A part. So we need you in this discussion. The question is, what do we have to take with us, or what do we or you take with you into your or our national parliaments? The moderation will be in the hands of Thomas Schneider. He's an ambassador and director of international relations at the Swiss Federal Office of Communications, and we have four cherished 
panelists here. I just introduce them very quickly. We'll uh, experience Marian Eyazer back on stage, still member of the Parliament of Egypt. Al Hagi Mo, member of the Parliament of Gambia. I all invite you cordially now on stage. Carla Sambelli, member of the Parliament of Brazil. And finally, Margarita Escobar as an MP of El Salvador. So they will have a five minutes impulse each. And thank you very much. Thomas Schneider will then uh, hold the discussion with you for the next, whatever, 25 minutes. We have microphones in the room. So good to have you here, Mr. Schneider. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It is a special honor for me to uh, chair this session because as someone, or moderate rather, uh, as someone who has and is involved in IGF, in the European IGF, in Eurodig, and also in the Swiss IGF, we've always tried to include parliamentarians in the discussions because that's one of the missing links, of course, if there is a disconnect between what is discussed in fora like this and the decision makers on all levels are not part of this discussion. Uh, so we're very, very happy and also thankful for, to Germany uh, who has taken uh, a lot of, of uh, steps to, to, to make this happen. And of course, also to you, the parliamentarians, for you to attend. So um, with this, let's start the discussion. And, and the first question is a simple one. It's basically there on the screen. What, what did you learn as parliamentarians? What did you, what did you experience as, as new information, new insights that you will take home and feed in into your discussions in your parliaments with your colleagues? And maybe also, was there something that you have been missing that was not discussed here that should have been discussed? Free to go ahead, whoever wants to go ahead, go ahead. Um, good morning and um, thank you very much. Um, first, I want to take this opportunity to um, uh, thank um, IGF in general and the German government for um, uh, including the parliamentarians in such a wonderful forum. Um, um, uh, it, personally, um, uh, I think it's essential that politicians actually engage at every level, um, especially when you talk about um, uh, the internet governance. Because if you look at worldwide, parliamentarians are at the center of governance, anywhere you go in this world. So having to discuss such a, a particular forum, I think it was good that parliamentarians actually engage. Now, personally, I think the co collaborative effort that actually I've seen in this IGF, I think is a key thing that I can take away to, to my country and uh, at the level of Africa as, as a whole. Because if you look at the um, uh, um, in governance structure, um, it, in, it involves everybody, actually. You, you, you need to engage the executive, you need to engage civil society organizations, you need to in, engage international organizations, and you also need to engage every aspect of society. And I think the IGF 2019 actually has clearly shown that um, uh, collaboration is key, and if they want this world to move forward, I think we all need to collaborate in and uh, get away from our individual um, uh, convenience and come together as one nation, come together as one world, uh, so that we can move this um, uh, world forward. I think the key here is the collaborative effort that we actually have seen. Um, it's a key takeaway. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to take an opportunity to, first of all, thank uh, the German parliament for this initiative, and in particular, Jimmy, whom I never met, but I love him dearly for his vision. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, one thing that I'm taking back is that we should fight for no walls in the internet. We want an open, free um, access to internet. That's for the benefits of humanity. So no virtual walls, I think, would be important for all of us. The other thing, I think we need to look at this issue of main relevance. Today, IGF has made a great step forward by including parliamentarians on this forum. And it is that we have connected the disconnected. 
in this case, parliaments, which at the end of the day, we are the ones making national legislations and the rules. So I think this is a very good approach and it was missing. So I take this back to my parliament and encourage other colleagues to get involved as well. Another point is that um, IGF national designations should play um, a bigger role. IGF national designations should include parliaments in their activities at national levels. IGF national designations should be more democratic in including all stakeholders at the national level, just as we have done it here. And so I didn't know this was an option, but now I know. And I will make sure that it ha this happens in El Salvador. Uh, I am promoting a bill in El Salvador's Congress about universal internet access as a human right based on the Council, Human Rights Council of the UN that considers internet a human rights. That bill, I introduced it about a month ago and will be on the floor, I hope, uh, shortly. And it will include children's rights, women's rights, and, and human rights uh, on the platforms. It's not an easy question, but it's there. So if anyone can help, can help, you're welcome with your ideas. I think Parliament should designate focal points for, for this IGF process, and the Interparliamentarian Union should also create a specific committee on technical aspects and national laws so that these focal points can follow on the spirit of this, uh, of this forum. I have other points, but I think I will, I will uh, stop here so that I, we allow the interesting comments from our colleagues. And thank you, Marianne, for your wonderful presentation this morning. Hello, everybody. My name is Carla Zambelli. I'm a congresswoman in Brazil, elected by the first time. Um, I am the same party of our president, Bolsonaro. And I would like to thank you the opportunity um, to be here and represent my country. But I apologize, but I will speak in Spanish because I think that way my, my electors and my people in Brazil will understand me better. Bueno, um, lo, que he, lo que he experimentado estos días, uh, lo mejor que he experimentado es conocer a las leyes, uh, las prácticas de todos los países. Y eso nos ha puesto en una situación en Brasil muy específica, porque nuestra, bueno, tenemos un país que es de tamaño continental, como Brasil. Uh, hemos tenido una situación muy, muy rara que hemos tenido el primer presidente electo por la Internet. Uh, nuestro presidente estaba hospitalizado porque han, tentado, han hecho un intentado contra su vida, o sea, estaba en el hospital y toda su, su elección fue hecha por Internet. Eh, yo estoy aquí, yo creo, porque... Um, hace algunos meses que soy la parlamentaria en Brasil más influente en la red social eh, y eso pasó después de las elecciones. Antes de las elecciones yo no era conocida y después de las elecciones hoy por mes yo alcanzo más o menos 80 millones de personas todos los meses por internet. O sea, nuestro alcance es muy importante. Pero considerando esto, Podemos imaginar la, la importancia de las plataformas digitales. Y, y por esta importancia, más que garantizar el acceso, y, y este panel incluso ha hablado mucho del de, de la, el acceso al Internet como si fuera un derecho humano, pero en un país donde gran parte de la población no tiene ni acceso al saneamiento, a un sanitario, hablar de Internet... Uh, como, un, 
como un derecho humano es algo un poco difícil de alcanzar. Uh, ese espacio era antes dominado por grandes empresarios, orga, uh, empresarios uh, que, to que uh, tomaban cuenta del acceso a la Internet, el acceso a la información principalmente. Lo que he visto aquí es que en todo el mundo la Internet ahora es algo que está, uh, no, no, solamente, no es algo solamente de las grandes empresas, sino que también de las personas normales como yo. Um, y es muy importante, y yo creo que Brasil está preocupado con el tema más importante, es la libertad del pensamiento. Yo, por ejemplo, soy de derecha, o sea, represento el partido de Bolsonaro, pero nuestro presidente está preocupado para que la izquierda también tenga la libertad de pensamiento. Es muy importante que la democracia en la Internet sea algo más que un derecho humano, tenemos que preocuparnos con la libertad de expresión. Y tenemos, por ejemplo, ahora un expresidente que ha acabado de salir del cárcel, que ya habla de censurar y regular la Internet, la prensa y las redes sociales. Y eso me preocupa mucho. Y yo creo que fue un tema hablado aquí por las leyes, pero también hemos dejado alguna cosa de fuera, porque hay que, hay que hablar de la represión que está, que está pasando en la Internet. En Facebook, por ejemplo, en Brasil, han deletado cerca de 400 cuentas. 400 personas que tenían libertad de expresión y de la noche para el día han perdido sus cuentas. Eso hay que hablar también. Entonces, no se puede privatizar la justicia de la libertad de expresión. Esto hay que estar en la justicia y no en plataformas comerciales. Pienso esto. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, dear colleagues, for your uh, remarks. And I come last for this question. And thank you for your kind words, dear Margo. Um, so uh, there is a lot to be taken uh, back uh, from this uh, important IGF. It's my first. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the first thing is the ecosystem that is there. Actually, the IGF had tackled a lot of issues, and each issue is related to another because we're looking forward for a better future, so we need to tackle uh, things as an ecosystem and not independently. This is the first thing. The second thing is the opportunity of exchange with fellow MPs to see the, the legislations that are there. And if the legislations do not cope enough with the new digital era that we are about to go through, we need to adjust ourselves. So this is a second take home message. The third uh, one is that as I know that the future belongs to, the, to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams, I do believe that together uh, with this exchange between technical people, uh, members of government, parliamentarians, private sector, this exchange will help us more to move forward to this one goal, one net, one vision for one world. So that's my take home message. I will share it with my fellow parliamentarians. We'll keep working on it with um, the member of the civil society in our country and the government and, and other stakeholders. Thank you very much. So in addition to, let's say, substantive takeaways, I, I see that the discussion on how do we work together in the spirit of cooperation and, and the inclusivity of all stakeholders working across silos is something that, that is seen as unique. It's maybe also seen as a little bit complicated, complex and not easy, but as necessary from, from what I hear from you. And, and as, as you all know, uh, this is one of the key actually of the key elements that, that is discussed in the report of the UN uh, Secretary General's uh, high-level panel on digital cooperation, where there are some recommendations, first there's some identification of gaps and then some recommendations on, on, on what to do. And so one question to you is, realizing that it is necessary to build a bridge from expert discussions in whatever forum, but of course also in, in a forum like the IGF and the national regional discussions, 
and decision makers, be it parliamentarians or governments or also uh, private sector decision makers, CEOs of companies and so on. How do we, what can we do? How do we build bridges between these silos? How do we better connect um, and, and going beyond just participation in a dialogue, but also when it comes to supporting decision making, making decision makers profiting from, from a dialogue like this. So how do we, how do we um, build these bridges concretely? What can be done? How can this be institutionalized? How can also, um, how can you get better connected to this notion of horizontal networks of different actors that take decisions, each one in their silos, being I can, be it I can, for instance, that takes decision on, on domain names, whereas uh, UNESCO or other UN institutions take decisions on content or education issues. How can these horizontal networks that take decisions, that develop standards, how can they be brought together with you so that you are also connected to other decision makers on national, uh, regional and global level. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much. I think when, we, um, when you look at it in totality, you realize that um, the fundamental thing that got to happen first is the building of trust among all the stakeholders. Um, once we build a, uh, a good trust among the stakeholders, you're going to see that then we can start to collaborate, we can start to move things forward. Now, if you look at the, the world uh, where we are going to right now, as far as technology is concerned, you will realize that um, uh, the politicians basically are at the center of, of most of the disruptive nature of, of the world. So, including politicians now, uh, for the politicians to, uh, to have a clear understanding, really, of where we are going to. And I think um, that will become very, very important. And again, the trust that is built around government. When I, when I say government, um, not only about the, 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 the politicians like the, the parliamentarian, but also the executive as well, I think they need to be at the center of everything. Then you have the private sector also on top. Then you also have a, a, a civil society organizations. So there needs to be this kind of link that actually provides trust in the middle. And again, you're gonna see that once we have that trust, each one of us would actually have to have a very clear understanding of where actually are we going to. Um, because when you look at the issues surrounding the internet or the issues surrounding internet governance itself, you're going to see that the key things is like for the, to the government is like um, uh, human rights issues. You look at um, 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 civil society organization, also it's about human rights issues. Then you look at the other uh, private sector. They're talking about like, how do I make money for my own institutions? Again, where it comes is like the digital economy. What do we do with the digital economy? What do we do with digital rights? Who is responsible for what? So I think the most important thing is to build that kind of trust among all the stakeholders, and once that actually uh, holds, that platform holds very well, then anything else can come, top, come, top of, uh, can come on top of it. Without trust, really, it's going to be really very difficult because each of, each of the stakeholders will, will really be on your own silos, be on your own part because there is no trust. In fact, and you can see this across the um, various countries when you want to fight cybersecurity. So we need to be able to create that cyberspace where trust is there, where we can actually um, uh, bring peace, where we can actually allow others to trust what, what the internet brings. Because if you remember, the, the, um, the, uh, the founding fathers of the internet basically was just to uh, make their work easier in terms of connecting. So they created various protocols, and again, it's human nature that the same human beings that created the internet and the same human beings also that tried to disrupt those protocols. But I think the fundamental key here is about building trust among all the stakeholders uh, across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, you know, nobody likes to deal with parliamentarians, but we have to deal with them anyways. Um, I think that um, a practical measure to enhance cooperation is to create in this um, IGF 2019 um, a steering committee from parliamentarians which under the leadership of the German uh, parliament, we can all help you to uh, bring to our regions the spirit of IGF 2019. So that's one practical recommendation, and I hope we can create that today, if possible. Two, I already mentioned, we should create focal points in our parliaments that deals exactly in um, specifically on this fora, and also in, um, in the Interparliamentary Union, uh, 
that should create uh, a specific committee on this issue. That's another practical suggestion. The other one I think it's important is that we should create guidelines for parliaments when we're drafting law. Those guidelines could be uh, taken from the work that has already been done I, um, at this forum and other institutions like uh, European, I don't want to mention anyone, but other institutions because I may, I may leave uh, some institutions left and that's not my intention. But having parliamentarian guidelines for drafting national laws that follow international standards, I think would be of the essence if we want to have one world, one net, and one vision, we need those draft lines. And on the cybersecurity uh, global commission report, I think we should all take a hard look at it. And if we do have any cyber laws at the national level, this is an opportunity to upgrade those laws according to the recommendations of the Global Commission on, on Cybersecurity. So for now, I will leave those four or five uh, uh, proposals to take into account. Bueno, estoy de acuerdo con mis colegas lo que ha dicho sobre confianza en los stakeholders y también las propuestas de nuestra colega Estoy de acuerdo y yo creo que a lo mejor podríamos hacer reuniones um, más a menudo, no solamente esperar el próximo IGF, sino que hablar antes y hacer como un comité de parlamentarios um, que tiene interés, que, que tiene algún, algún tipo de ligación con este tema. Um, yo insisto que las plataformas de comunicación en Internet, son muy importantes que haya confianza, como ha hablado mi colega, trust. Tenemos que tener confianza en estas plataformas. No podemos privatizar la justicia hacia ellas. Hay otro tema también que son los algoritmos. Que yo creo que los algoritmos crean como ampollas de pensamiento que acaban no permitiendo que esta misma pluralidad que tenemos aquí hoy, izquierda, derecha, centro, hablando unos con los otros, esta pluralidad de ideas que garantiza la, esta coexistencia, esta democracia, hace el pensamiento político, que es importante para nosotros parlamentarios. Eh, los algoritmos nos dejan um, como, como que ampollas de pensamiento, o sea, que hay que también ampliar este pensamiento y hablar con los diferentes. Um, entonces creo que garantizar la democracia de la información en las plataformas de comunicación, uh, hablarnos más a menudo, saber también que a lo mejor una ley que cabe muy bien aquí en Alemania, incluso Angela Merkel, ha hablado un tema muy importante que es el tema de la infraestructura de ligación de las plataformas en todo el mundo, que esto centraliza mucho más la información en las plataformas y eso nos deja como a merced de la, de la información hacia ellos. Um, es algo también que tenemos que hablar como parlamentares y a lo mejor yo creo que la solución está en la en conocer a los otros, porque por ejemplo a lo mejor la ley aquí de Alemania no sirve para Brasil. La ley que funciona aquí en las plataformas para garantizar um, que, no hay, que no haya fake news, por ejemplo, eh, no funcionaría en Brasil, porque allí hay que tener libertad de pensamiento y hay que, eh, la justicia que tiene cu que cuidar de esos temas de fake news y no una plataforma que es de una empresa y que tiene un pensamiento único Entonces, yo creo mucho en la justicia en estos temas. Eh, yo creo que es esto. So, as the last to answer the question, uh, I do agree with all my colleagues, and I second the opinions of trust that you both mentioned, and also the steering committee, and as you mentioned, Margot, that uh, we should right now, and you remi reminded me of Elvis Presley's song, it's... Do you know the song? It's, it's 
now or never. So it's now or never to work together as uh, multi-stakeholders. And um, I recall that during issuing, uh, for example, in Egypt, the cybersecurity law, uh, we had like 21 sessions in the committee before the general sessions. One third of these sessions was with government, uh, national institutes, private sectors, universities, all like uh, there was inclusion for women, for disability, for everyone to uh, say their opinion about this law. So this was um, a seed for, you know, a good uh, law that needs to, to be improved every now and then. But the basis is, is working together is something important. And I, I, I like to say that the word team, if we team up with the stakeholders, the word team is T-E-A-M, together each achieves more. That's team, together each achieves more. The thing uh, also that I think that our goal is not easy. We have a lot of challenges, but uh, today's inspiration is tomorrow's motivation. We are so motivated to work and to make it happen. If we have a steering committee, this would be great. But work on building trust is not an easy job. It will demand us a lot of effort and a lot of credibility as well, that those opinions that are said are taken into consideration once they are correct. This creates um, a circle of people looking to the same goal. And I think on the international level, if we can do it, and on the national level to work with the local stakeholders, I think things will be much, much better. Thank you. And I would also fully agree, trust <clears throat> is a fundamental component because if you don't trust each other, it's difficult to work together. And trust is also a result of cooperation because if you work with others, you get to know each other, you get to know that you may disagree but maybe your lives are different or your situation is different and the other, the other views or the other interests may be legitimate as well as yours and, and this is a basis of trust. Of course, trust also needs some rules that create trust. So a certain <clears throat> reliability, predictability of the forms of cooperation or the underlying principles is also an important element uh, where, and, and, and the clarity about the respective roles of the industry, what is the role of a, of a platform, what should not be the role of a platform. This is also something that is hotly debated, has been hotly debated since they exist, uh, I think, guess in all our countries. And then, of course, the cooperation between national parliaments through institu ideas to institutionalize, uh, <clears throat> a connection to the IGF, also to institutionalize structures in the Interparliamentary Union, that would help to liaise the focal points or whatever you call them from different national parliaments so they have an exchange there and help them also to, to access, uh, um, be able to, to provide and, and share material, share ideas. And of course, an important point is the guidance. There's a number of intergovernmental institutions around the world, but also private policy networks that produce guidelines private commissions that produce guidelines that think about some issues that, of course, the, somebody needs to read this, so it takes resources, it takes time, but the better people are connected and share that burden, again, the more you can actually profit from all of this. So, <clears throat> one last question, uh, a short one to all of you, and then um, it has already been mentioned, there are microphones in the middle of the room, so please <clears throat> join the discussion and uh, contribute ask questions, make comments, so that we can involve more people in the discussion. The last question is, is something that, in particular at fora like this, I keep realizing that even after years of discussion, meeting and talking to each other is one thing, but then you realize you may even use the same words, but if you come from a civil society institution or if you're a politician or a technical uh, member of the technical community, you may have a completely different understanding of the same words uh, because you have a historical or, or social different concepts. So how, how can this, let's say, language gap be bridged uh, between the different silos so that they also, when you legislate, that you actually 
uh, the measures that you intend to do, you actually get the result and not maybe the opposite of what you intend to do, just because the language is different, the cultures is different and, and there's no common understanding of, of what needs to be done. Um, th thank you very much. I think um, uh, the issue of language actually has um, and will continue to be an issue um, in governance, um, especially at the level of legislation. Now, um, uh, with language, um, uh, you're going to see that our understanding uh, basically may be different due to cultural issues. But perhaps sometimes also you will realize that uh, people tend to understand things at their own benefit, for example, because the human mind itself is actually corrupt. You know what I mean? So what, what is the most important thing is to us to have a common understanding and a common ground on the meaning of certain um, technology, for example. We need to have a common understanding. Um, we need to have a common platform. Because if you look at um, a few days ago when we were talking about how all this internet came about, about the various protocols that was created. I mean, the, the reason why they were created is because so that they can have a clear understanding. So which means you can have like one um, infrastructure be able to communicate with another. So that's the essence of communication, which means there must be an understanding, which means there must be terms of reference. So generally speaking, um, in terms of legislation, we must have some international interpretations of particular words or particular terms or phrases so that it doesn't get lost along the way because of translation. Because again, anywhere you go in the world, you know, even in the English language, sometimes the choice of word that I use in the Gambia may be quite different from the choice of word I use in the US. But the most fundamental thing or the most important thing is for us to have a common understanding that this is exactly what we meant when we say this phrase or this is what we meant when we um, uh, agree on a particular word. But I think the most important thing is to have a general understanding about the meaning of particular words, meaning of particular phrases. Uh, whenever you go to a, any kind of language, then at least you are really very consistent. You may not be 100% correct, but at least the consistency in terms of meaning, then it becomes very important. Thank you. If I were to be, thank you, Ambassador, for, the, for, the, uh, for this in, very important question is, uh, how do we understand each other? Uh, well, for me, Monday, the first time I came to the meeting, I was really thinking if I was in the right or the wrong place. I didn't get it. But now, um, I see that I've been able to, to understand the words, the concepts, the, the challenges, and the answers. So this leads me to, to think that knowing and meeting each other, each other in one room, talking about the same issues, is the best practical way of uh, diminishing the bridge between politicians and technical people. We have to learn from technical aspects, and I don't necessarily think that technicals should learn about politics uh, language. No one wants to be in that arena, trust me sometimes. But um, so I find that a practical example is this, what we have done today from Monday to Friday, five days. If I were to say in my parliament, come on, let's do um, law 4.0 and let's all, all of us get together and do legislation 4.0. I bet that they would think I'm crazy. Some of them might want to follow, but the rest will never embark in such an uh, adventure. Nevertheless, we're doing it. We're now considering uh, personal data protection in Avias Data. Uh, we will start studying the universal inclusion to internet, and I agree with our colleague from Brazil. It's not gonna be easy, we have other problems, but we need to start now thinking about that because in El Salvador, which is a small country, only 30% have access to internet. So we parliamentarians should worry about that, especially that is considered a human right from the Council of Human Rights of the UN. So bottom line, how do we breach the language? We're all human. We must be able to understand each other. And where legislation 4.0 will take us will depend on all of us and that global understanding of issues. 
to have one world, one net, and one vision. Thank you. Eh, hay una cosa, bueno, esta pregunta es muy filosófica, así que, y yo soy una persona muy práctica, así que para mí es muy difícil um, hablar específicamente de estas diferencias, incluso porque las diferencias son muy grandes, de Brasil hasta África, hacia Egipto. Entonces, lo que, lo que hemos sentido en Brasil es que el mundo está cambiando mucho. Eh, hemos tenido por internet, por ejemplo, una confusión muy grande hace unas semanas, que el mundo ha pensado que Amazonia estaba quemando. Y los incendios en gran parte están, están siendo descubiertos como criminosos. O sea, ONGs, ONGs, que supuestamente deberían estar eh, protegiendo a Amazonia, estaban poniendo fuego en Amazonia para criminalizar en un gobierno que es nuevo, de derecha. Y tenemos en Brasil el primer año, es el primer año, Hace 20 años que nunca Amazonia ha quemado tan poco. Las, sí, hace, hemos tenido mucha fake news. Incluso un jefe de Estado poniendo una foto de una jirafa que mande a Amazonia, donde no hay jirafas. O sea, la Internet es, es un mundo particular. Y, y esta libertad de expresión, de pensamiento, tenemos que garantizar a todos, sea de derecha, sea de izquierda. Ese es el punto. Y es el punto principal que estamos viviendo en Brasil. Y, y el problema de Brasil hay que ser comprendido por los brasileños. Y por las personas también que no viven en Brasil, pero hay que, hay que escuchar todos los lados. Y yo creo que la Internet hay un problema serio de que se escucha un lado nada más. Um, I see this connection. Uh, I see that I'm a connection by myself. I have a technical background and I'm a parliamentarian. So this like made life easier. So I would uh, say rather like a recipe to open the channels with other fellow parliamentarians who are not technical. Uh, there is like a news digest about um, what happens in the international level and national level that I send on a weekly basis to my fellow parliamentarians. And I was surprised that even those who are not, who do not care a bit about uh, technology started interacting on, on a personal level and getting to ask me uh, like uh, the best practices for something or so started, started opening the appetite of other parliamentarians that our word of technical stuff is not a bad word. It's, it's a life word. This is the first thing. The second is, uh, once there is this appetite, we have to use it. And I guess in every parliament, there is the possibility of giving training to other parliamentarians. And we are never too old to learn. So by, by making some cooperation with the training institute of the parliament, for example, we can give training sessions to fellow parliamentarians to understand more. Those who have good appetite will join the training sessions And the third step will be forming a support group of people who are like advocates for uh, our world, of, of our digital world. These people will be responsible or, of opening the appetite of other people and the circle continues. Appetite, awareness and training, forming a group and that's it. This will help so much when there are laws or any new issues to be tackled in the parliament to find a good group that has formed good ideas and up-to-date uh, policies to tackle these issues. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, the best practice that we can have.
Thank you very much, in particular for these practical solutions, so there are concrete things that can be done. So we have a few people that have been waiting uh, for quite some time. You need to go to the, to the microphones, those that want to speak, because there's no microphones here, but there's four or five in the back, so please go and line up. So the first one was the gentleman on the right, Wild, please. <coughs> uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, we had a pilot project workshop on Wednesday in which 20 colleagues of all the parliamentarians participated in and shared the views with the technical community on the deployment of internet standards that would make the internet safer immediately for everyone once deployed. The question I wanted to ask have been answered by Ms. Azera and Ms. Escobar, but I want to compliment you on is that we started the discussion with five concept recommendations that we, I will not reiterate here. But we came up, thanks to you, with the sixth one, that there is a profound need for the technical community and policymakers and parliamentarians to learn what their worlds are about. And that the technical community translates their protocols and standards in language that you can understand, but because policy actually is also made in a way in the technical standards that there's need to get into action going. And my question was, how can we arrange that? But I think the both of you gave some excellent examples how to do that. So please start working together to reach that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wout. Let's, Thank you. Let's move on. We have about Thank four, you. five, six minutes left. So let's move Thank on to the, to the person in the middle. Yes, that has been waiting also for quite a while. Thank you, Thomas. My name is Willem Faber. I'm a member of Parliament in South Africa. We have already have an ICT forum in the place in Parliament for the past 10 years. Currently, we are busy implementing paperless Parliament to try also help people get involved with internet connection between members, etc. The mandate has also been expanded in June 2019 to include artificial intelligence in our lawmaking processes. We believe in an open source society where there should be internet available for everyone. But with that, there should be accountability from government side with a safeguard of individuals' data. Legislation should be put in place to safeguard our people, as this abuse from outside can be a huge threat in all countries. Artificial intelligence in the fourth industrial revolution is also exciting, and it should help us all through health, education, as well as with good governments. And we also now hope, as we've seen the launch of the contract of the web by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, as a good start to create good protocol and guidelines with universal trust moving forward. And I thank you for this IG government forum this year. I think it was super. Thank you. Thank you as well. Um, the lady on the right from our side. Um, Bonjour. Excuse me, um, we, we go around, so please let the, let the lady go okay. and then. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Thomas. I wanted to propose a dialogue with the Brazilian parliamentary. As part of the IGF community, I very much appreciate the presence of the representatives here, as well as their interest in the internet governance topic. But as we take, as we take a look in the Brazilian politics, there has been some misleading recent developments, such as the termination of national participatory bodies and councils, and other spaces for civic space engagement. Also, cons the concerns mentioned by the parliamentary regarding freedom of expression are indeed important as our press faces daily attacks from the government or whoever, and whoever criticizes the president can be fa framed as a fake news creator or disseminator. But um, given your experience here, Carla, uh, my question will be how you would see the Brazilian parliament building bridges between the government and civil society and us fostering our participation and collaboration. Thank you. Okay. Let's, let's allow her to give a short answer, but don't try too much to go into too much international politics. This is something that you can <laughs> 
do do uh, hopefully you will continue at, at lunch or whenever let's let's try and remain on 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 on, on this thing no hay problema um, bueno realmente muchos consejos uh, han sido cerrados bien como muchas pesquisas en brasil estamos teniendo un problema en brasil que hace muchos años la corrupción uh, ha robado mucho del pueblo. Tenemos un país con muchos recursos, sin ningún terror. No tenemos terrorismo, no tenemos problemas naturales. No tenemos, tenemos todos los recursos que un país pueda tener, pero no teníamos lo mínimo del mínimo, porque hemos tenido los más grandes robo y casos de corrupción del mundo en Petrobras. Billones y billones de reales han sido desviados y en muchos de esos casos por consejos eh, dichos por la sociedad civil pero que no hacían nada sino que um, practicar activismo um, cuando digo que bueno yo soy una parlamentar normal y corriente pero en facebook yo estoy exigiendo en este momento y tengo aquí los números si queréis puedo enseñar después de, la, de esta reunión 27 millones de personas por mes en Facebook. En Instagram, 11.5 millones de personas. En Twitter, 40 millones de personas por mes. Eso está pasando en Brasil porque los medios de comunicación no están sosteniendo sus informaciones. Las informaciones que vemos hoy en la prensa, que tiene su libertad de expresión garantizada, no están en en confianza con el pueblo. El pueblo lee la noticia y no se sostiene. Entonces buscan a parlamentarios como yo, por ejemplo, para tener la información más garantizada. Lo que vemos en la imprensa es una cosa, lo que pasa en la realidad de Brasil es otra. Pero como no es el tema de, de este congreso, estoy a disposición después de la reunión para hablarnos más. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, the gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, monsieur le euh, panéliste, le modérateur. Moi, je m'appelle Coronel Massani. Je suis député à l'Assemblée nationale du Niger. Et je suis très satisfait de toutes les activités qui se sont déroulées dans euh, ce forum. Mais j'ai un certain nombre de critiques. Le barrage linguistique est un problème important qui doit être levé. Parce que quand vous réunissez des parlementaires et que c'est juste les membres du panel qui parlent, nous, vous nous donnez une deux minutes, ça, c'est déjà un problème. Les parlementaires, ils sont là pour parler, pour débattre. Donc, il faut, dans l'avenir, prévoir suffisamment de temps pour que les gens s'expriment. Premièrement. Deuxièmement, et par rapport au barrage linguistique. Moi, je suis dans un pays francophone. Je suis dans un parlement où on a initié un forum au niveau communautaire. Euh, CDAO et COATS. Donc nous sommes actuellement en train de préparer un forum pour janvier prochain, du 16 au 18 janvier 2020. Nous avons fait beaucoup de choses dans notre Parlement, on a adopté des lois, mais toutes les discussions auxquelles j'ai participé depuis le 25 euh, jusqu'à euh, hier, c'est des discussions où il n'y a pas de traduction. Moi, je ne parle pas très bien l'anglais. Mon anglais est, est faible. Vous voyez, là, il y a une injustice. Donc quand vous parlez de la confiance. Comment quelqu'un va vous faire confiance s'il ne comprend pas ce que vous dites Je pense que les propositions qui ont été faites par la, 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 la dame, du, la députée du, du Salvador, elles sont très très bien. Il faut faire mettre en place un steering committee qui va préparer avant le, 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 le prochain forum, le IGF de 2020, il faut préparer une organisation qui va permettre aux parlementaires de s'exprimer correctement. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Le euh, monsieur à la gauche. Bonjour. Pardon. Uh, yes, we, 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 go, we go one mic by mic. And please try to be short. We have like one minute, one minute left. So we can take two, two short interventions. And, or, yeah. So please be short. Thank you. Hello. 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 Yes, I'm uh, Safar from uh, DRC. I want just first to thank the German 
Digital Agenda Committee for this initiative. And we'd like to ask them to take the lead. The lead that to make this first event where the, the parameter have access now on the discussion to make these things continue even for the further session on, on giving the ownership from the top level of the AGF secretary. And also to make a follow-up how those parameters are doing back home. As we say, what as our permit will be, will have to do back home. And on my point of view, I think I'll hope that in the next few future, I'll also become like uh, Jimmy Schulz in Congo and making also an agenda, digital agenda in Congo. But for this, we have to make it not on a country by country, but it should be a thing that is global and to make sure that all the parameters are going on the same direction, maybe not on the same speed, but on the same uh, direction. And for this, I'm requesting the German digital agenda to take the lead on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm hearing from the organizers that we have a little bit more time so we can uh, let you uh, uh, get a, a few more. Um, let's go to the mic over there. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name's uh, Pamela Masai, a member of parliament, East African Legislative Assembly from Tanzania. Uh, my question to the organizer is, we have heard a lot about the issues which can bring us together, which uh, one of them is to bring the interparliamentary, to do the interparliamentary dialogues. Also, we need the uh, inter-country dialogues. But uh, the big question is, we're going to do the dialogue with the people who are not really aware of the digital internet. Uh, I really suggest that the IGF can come up maybe with a specific portal or specific program which can go, which can be sent to the uh, countries and specific to the specific institutions so that they can understand what really IGF is doing and what is the main target for both of us so that we can reach the main goal. Thank you. Thank you. Just before giving the floor to, to Aida, just one remark um, on, on, on the requests. The, the, these ideas are very good. There's one thing that is of course needed to make them happen, which is money. And the, this year's host has, uh, as you know, uh, took a little bit of money in the hand to make things happen that maybe before have not been possible. So we need to find, and the IGF is something that is voluntarily funded by some governments, by some, some private actors, and it is helpful if you as parliamentarians go back to your countries and allow your government or ask your government to actually spend money on platforms of dialogue for digital uh, uh, for understanding, because a lot of times politicians and also CEOs say, well, these fora where people just talk are not important because no decisions are taken, so why, why spend money on this? And dialogue is the first step to come to reasonable decisions, come to a peaceful understanding. So it's important also the message that you as parliamentarian can bring home and say, we need to invest in this kind of dialogue. We need to support the IGF and other fora so that they can deliver the services that we would all wish uh, it to deliver. Uh, with this, let me give the floor to uh, hey. Aida. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonjour. Thomas. Uh, my name is Christina Aguida and I work for the Egyptian government. And I would like to start uh, by thanking the German government, uh, the Ger German government and the German parliament for bringing in parliamentarians to this IGF. Uh, I am so proud to see many parliamentarians from our region, from Africa, uh, from the Middle East and from Egypt, of course, Dr. Aizel. Uh, one thing uh, that I would like to bring to the attention of parliamentarians who many have expressed is their first time to be at the IGF. Uh, I want to draw the attention that 
Um, there is a network of over 100 um, of national, regional and youth IGFs that happen on a grassroots level in uh, the different countries and the different regions. And this network has been uh, identified um, by the report of the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation as a strength of the IGF. I hope uh, that parliamentarians can go back home to their regions and connect with those networks and maybe enforce them, support them, and bring the voices back and make connect the dots into the global IGF. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. Just one information. The, these uh, uh, national and regional Bonjour. structures are not formally linked to the IGF, but you find all the, the list of those that exist on the IGF website with the contacts, so you can get to them. Just a quick reply. Just a quick reply. Thank you, Ms. Arida. And I want to share with you a secret that without Ms. Arida, I wouldn't have been here because she's the one who told me about the IGF and encouraged me and did the old delaying. So I thank her very much. And this is a real model of like working together, uh, together between the parliament and the government. So it's a live example. Thank you. Thank you for this example. That uh, gentleman Merci. in the middle. Thank you. Merci, bonjour. Je suis Monsieur Aïcher Abakar Hassan, député à l'Assemblée nationale tchadienne, président de la Commission communication, nouvelles technologies de l'information et de la communication, droits fondamentaux et libertés. Je suis euh, très ravi de, et je remercie beaucoup le Bundestag allemand qui nous a invités pour participer à cette IGF. Je salue également euh, l'initiative prise par le panel de créer un comité de pilotage qui peut réunir tous les parlementaires. Par contre, euh, comme tout à l'heure, mon ami qui s'est passé, nous sommes pleins de la, euh, de la barrière linguistique qui s'est euh, érigée entre nous, euh, francophones et anglophones, parce que tout l'IGF était en anglais et nous n'avons pas la traduction ni le document en français. Ça, c'est un point. D'autre part, mon pays, le Tchad, a organisé le dernier mois, ces derniers mois hein, l'IGF au Tchad, en Djamena, qui a vu la participation de 45 pays africains et plus de 3 000 participants. J'aimerais bien que les conclusions et les résolutions de ce forum soient intégrées à l'IGF de Berlin et que les gens sachent quels sont les problèmes qui se posent aux Africains et quelles sont les solutions idoines qu'ils doivent apporter à ces Africains pour qu'ils puissent accéder à ces nouvelles technologies. La question que je pose est la suivante. Euh, Est-ce que la fracture numérique est définitivement soudée Parce que à Genève, en 2003, nous avons parlé de la fracture numérique entre le monde développé et le monde sous-développé. Deuxième question, est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, les pays du Nord euh, et du Sud ont le même niveau de développement pour avancer ensemble vers l'inclusion. Parce que nous, je crois qu'à mon avis, il y a beaucoup de défis et de barrières à l'inclusion. Et ces barrières et ces défis doivent être relevés, non seulement par les pays africains, par l'aide de la communauté internationale. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, comme euh, une panéliste avait parlé de 30% seulement, des gens qui ont 30% accès à l'Internet, en Afrique, il y a moins de 30% qui ont accès à l'Internet. Et je crois qu'au niveau de l'UIT, quand le DG de l'UNIT parlait de l'éducation, parlait de l'électricité en brousse, parlait de la technologie qui doit être en brousse, tous ces défis-là ne peuvent être relevés que par un apport international. Parce que nous, en Afrique, aujourd'hui, dans les grandes villes, il y a l'électricité. Mais en brousse, vous n'avez pas d'électricité et nous avons été, sommes confrontés également à un autre problème. Chez nous, au Tchad, c'est le terrorisme qui fait des ravages. Et donc, ces cyberattaques-là, nous devrons euh, avoir des aides importantes pour les contrecarrer. Parce que ces attaques criminelles nous causent beaucoup de tort, Et non seulement au pays, mais également à son développement. Et je vous remercie. Merci à vous, monsieur. Euh, le temps avance. Alors, je vous encourage vivement de continuer les discussions à midi, l'après-midi et surtout aussi après. Et euh, alors maintenant, j'aimerais redonner euh, 
la... le contrôle sur ce... <rire> cet entretien au modérateur, à la modératrice principale. Je vous remercie beaucoup. C'est clair qu'il n'y a jamais assez de temps pour, pour, pour euh, euh, parler de tous les sujets, mais je crois que... Euh, on a eu un bon départ ici à Berlin. Euh, encore une fois, un remerciement. Euh, et aussi à Jimmy, que c'était un bon ami de moi. On a discuté euh, plusieurs fois à les IGF euh, que ça a été fait possible pour qu'on puisse se voir dans ce cadre. Merci beaucoup. Dans le salle, ici. Et je vous remercie beaucoup parce que je ne suis pas un membre de Parlement. Je suis seulement une journaliste. Mais je suis très touchée et très mauvaise par cette discussion, c'est pour moi, c'est quelque chose que je prends euh, pour moi, pour euh, n'importe quoi. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup à vous. Merci. Thank you very much, Thomas Schneider, for keeping the fire and really holding the fire during this discussion. Thank you for your strong contributions from the various countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I and I hope we are still connected with remote hubs out there and people that are still uh, connected with us online. And for the last panel uh, before lunch, I'm now very glad to hand over the microphone to Professor Dr. Wolfgang Kleinwächter from the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. And in a couple of minutes, he will bring on stage Manuel Höferlin as a member of the German Parliament. So the question now is, is the presentation and the discussion of the parliamentarian messages. So please enjoy. Thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter and I'm one of these old IGF veterans. And my duty is to guide you through the final part of this session. And you know, internet policy making is always done in an open and transparent way, and but bottom up. And we have tried to summarize the debate you had the last couple of days among parliamentarians in a very brief document, uh, which is uh, called the messages from the meeting of parliamentarians participating in the 14th UN Internet Governance Forum. This is not a resolution, this is not a declaration, and as we all know from the internet world, you know, guidelines and messages are adopted more or less by rough consensus. So that means it's a broad understanding and not everybody has to agree with every single word if you support the main message. It's called message and as I said, it's not a formal resolution or declaration. And uh, because we remember Jimmy uh, in, 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 in many of these fora here, uh, the proposal was made uh, to um, call this messages the Jimmy Schultz call. And I have a very personal memory because it was the IGF in Nairobi uh, in the year 2011, the first where Jimmy participated, and the idea that sometimes Germany will host an IGF came up uh, out from this very first meeting, and he was the very first German member of a parliament who came to an IGF and mobilized then others, including uh, Manuel Höfelin, will, who will guide you through the final part of this document. This document has three parts. The first part is a chapeau. Then uh, come some references to other documents. And the final part includes some operational paragraphs, which uh, include also the proposal made just in the discussion to continue the work in form of an IGF group of parliamentarians. You know, the chapeau uh, has one main key point, and that is the internet is uh, a controversial issue. And if you want to move forward, you have to balance conflicting interests. Uh, I think this is really the main message, balance. Balance is this keyword, and we have issues in the so-called four baskets or buckets of the internet world, security, 
economy, human rights and technology. And whatever you do, you have to balance the various interests and, 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 and conflict things. I think this is the main starting point for parliamentarians. And I think this is not new for uh, people sitting in the parliament that they have to find compromises. And that means to balance conflicting interests. You know, the second part of this document is um, uh, references to six um, different um, uh, other documents and fora. Uh, you know, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. We discuss internet governance since nearly 20 years or even more, and there has been achievements. And if you want to move forward, you should build on this what has been achieved. The internet is a layered system, and what we have to do now is although to accept this layered approach to internet policy making and we should build our next steps on uh, this what has been achieved. And this is mainly the Tunis Agenda, which is a very good document. This is the Net Mundial Declaration, which was uh, came out, you know, from a uh, multi-stakeholder process in the year 2014 and has described a little bit more in detail what the multi-stakeholder approach is. These are, um, uh, you know, resolutions by the United Nations, which have declared and this is supported by all the 193 member states of the UN, that international law and human rights are relevant both offline and online. And I think this is a really a big building block for our activities in, in national parliaments in the years ahead. And this is also uh, an interesting uh, uh, building block is the many reports we have from the various commissions, uh, Thomas mentioned the report by the high-level uh, panel on digital cooperation, which was established by the UN Secretary General. So there has been commissions uh, established by the International Labour Organization on the future of work. Um, uh, the lady from El Salvador mentioned the Global Commission and Stability in Cyberspace. We have a lot of ideas. So there is no need to reinvent the wheel. Let's use the existing documents. And for you as parliamentarians, the work of the Internet, uh, International Parliamentarian Union, the IPU, is of special importance. That means you, you can use this international network if you move forward. And the IPU has um, uh, renewed its uh, report on the so-called e-parliament, which has a lot of good ideas and innovation, you know, what you can do as parliamentarians. And this is also relevant for the uh, um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which has been adopted of the United Nations. And there's a special reference to the SDG uh, number nine, which uh, is directed to uh, the issue with we have here discussed. This is the framework uh, we have. And um, if we look forward, we see already uh, for the next decade uh, some milestones. You know, the next big thing will probably be the um, document which is under a discussion now for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. This could become an important guideline where you can bring a lot of ideas to the international level and then you can uh, benefit from this in your national discussions. There will be in the year 2025 a WISIS plus 20 conference and probably, you know, this will become like a World Internet Summit, because, you know, the world was different 20 years ago, and when we come together in the year 2025 to review the outcome of the World Summit, this will be another big thing, and then in the year 2030, we have to uh, look back what we have achieved with the Sustainable Development Goals. And the third part of this document includes the operational paragraphs, and I ask Manuel to come uh, to the podium and to uh, guide us through uh, these uh, five paragraphs, and then we can uh, adopt by acclamation the Jimmy Schulz call. Manuel. Yeah, thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, last year in, pa in Paris, I uh, participated in the IGF for the first time. Uh, it was the year where I really felt a part of it, this year, not in Paris. Jimmy Schulz, for a long time, was the only parliamentarian from Germany 
who participated at the IGF. And as told, he, he came back to us and told us from the IGF. And he really was on fire every time and said, it's a, a great meeting. We have to join this. We have to be a part of the IGF. And so last year in Paris, I first understood what he told me. And uh, it's a very special place, the, the IGF, because people from all over the world come together from different views, from different uh, parts of the world and parts of society. And they're talking about the future of the internet and learn new things every day. And all of it within a welcoming and open-minded culture of conversation, as you know, as you are here. And sadly, as you all know, Jimmy Schulz passed away on day zero of the IGF. And we remembered him in the opening and he is part of a lot of meetings of speeches here. In the conversations with the parliamentary, especially on Wednesday, we had a, a meeting first with the ICANN board and after that with, uh, um, um, with WINTSAF. And we had about 40 minutes between these two meetings. And uh, all the parliamentarians who were at the first meeting there just stayed in the room and we talked to each other. Some of you are there. Uh, Margarita, it was a great um, spontaneous meeting. And in that meeting, we, we developed the idea to call this parliamentarian outcome Jimmy Schultz call. And uh, I don't want to read loud these five points you all can read, but especially I want to stress three of the recommendations of the Jimmy Schultz call. We parliamentarians want to enhance international cooperation and the exchange of the best practices among national parliaments. I think it's important, and you heard it from the colleagues. I think it's a great picture to, to see it as, let us be Jimmy Schulz going home and tell our people what the IGF is and to light up a fire in our countries so that we maybe come back with more parliamentarians to be a part of this multi-stakeholder uh, meeting every year somewhere in the world. And um, yeah. We parliamentarians want to integrate the multi-stakeholder approach when passing legislation governing the internet in our parliaments. And that's also important because we can take a part of this culture here of the IGF back in our parliaments. And our parliaments are very different. We have a different culture of talking to each other in our parliaments. And we have... Uh, let me be, uh, let's say, friendly. We have free and we have more free parliaments and free and more free speeches possibilities in the country. So maybe we can take this, this culture of the IGF back in our countries and back in our parliaments to enhance the talking about uh, free internet and the future in internet, especially. And lastly, the most importantly to Jimmy, I know it and most of us who know him personally knows it, we parliamentarians want to work towards an informal parliamentary IGF group. And we bring together parliamentarians from all over the world on future IGFs. And I say, we started here at the IGF at that idea, and uh, maybe we can uh, enforce it in Poland the next years, and that would be a great thing. And let me respond to one thing. The IPU and other organizations are often limited to a special count of persons who are in the delegation. Here at the IGF, everybody can come here and to every, IG, to every IGF. And it's also in, men, in, in some countries a question that not every member of parliament who is part of the opposition has the possibility to come to international conferences. Maybe it's normal quite normal here in Germany, not always. Sometimes it's limited to two parliamentarians, and then these two parliamentarians are the two parliamentarians of the two biggest parts, parties in the parliament. But in other countries, it's not normal. So it's a good idea to have an open space where parliamentarians from all over the world, doesn't matter if they are part of the government or part of the opposition, can come here, Come, can come to the IGF meetings in the future and talk about the future and the freedom of the internet. And that's, I think, that would be Jimmy's idea that the IGF 
includes parliamentarians of all of the parties and all different thinkings and ideas in that multi-stakeholder process in, in the IGF. Thank you, especially you parliamentarians and all the participants uh, in this year's IGF. And I also want to thank the hosts and the organizers and me as a part of the opposition to the government, of course, who spent a lot of money uh, to make this possible, also to invite uh, the, the parliamentarians all over the world. The letter was signed from Wolfgang Schäuble, uh, the president of the German parliament, and Jimmy Schulz, the head of the digital committee. Um, but all these letters have to be sent out and everything uh, needs money, as told, and uh, thanks to the government in Germany to, to make this also possible. And I think with this call, we did something great today, and I'm, I'm sure pretty would be, Jimmy would be pretty proud of us. And thank you for being here, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye in Karowice next year. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your long time attention today. Merci beaucoup à tous. Uh, we have a lunch now until three o'clock in the afternoon, and we will be bringing it all together in the form of a heart at three o'clock on this stage. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>